Uh, opening the meeting of the Montpelier Roxbury Board of School Directors, uh, December 12th, December 13th, uh, at 6.32. Um, so first order is public comment. I um, want to note we are having a second public comment after the budget presentation, so you're welcome to speak twice, but uh, if you have planning to make comments on the budget and want to see it first, we'll, there will be an opportunity to comment after the budget. Um, and just reiterating, public comment is uh, a time when uh, the board listens. Uh, it's very important to our decision-making process and uh, we take comments very seriously. We also really appreciate the time, effort, and thought that goes into comments. We know sometimes it can be uh, difficult to get in front of a body like the board and talk. We really appreciate it and want to make it as welcoming as possible. Uh, but we do, we are in listen only mode and we do not respond in real time, although we, we take the comments very seriously and then try to get some sort of response out when appropriate. Um, do I have anyone who wants to go public comment now? And again, if you go now, you can go later, um, either in the room or, and if you're online please use the raise hand function if you know how to use it if not just go off camera and uh signal to us that you would like to talk so we have one person in the room um so please go ahead and take the chair in front of us and uh, also uh announce your name for the folks that are and for us too all right good evening folks jim mike and barry i'm off your resident um appreciate all y'all are doing i think it's Make a thankless task at time. So again, thank you for being here and doing what you do. Um, track by the numbers real quick. And uh, for you all, you've seen it in the email, but I think the greater public needs to understand too. Um, to my surprise, it turns out that track and field is our largest spring sport in our Montpelier Roxbury School District. Didn't know that until yesterday afternoon. Um, and so I think that's something that is important because some folks have said in the past, oh, only a few people use the track. So it's actually a very large sport. Uh, I saw your numbers there real quick. So if my math was good, uh, with the 40 students that were in the track program last spring, that's 11% of the high school student body. And then with the 90 students in the middle school, uh, that's 27% of the middle school um, body. And so the numbers are right again. Math is not my strong suit. 18% of the whole um, MRPS school district student uh, athletes, students, uh, they're in track and field. So uh, if we can keep the funds set aside for the track renovation, please do. If the fiscal reality is such that you cannot do that, then please keep as much of the funds there as you can, especially to make immediate improvements to the track that can make it just safe and functional for its upcoming track season. Um, I get that there's other reports coming out from consultants. I don't anticipate they're gonna recommend relocating the high school. Um, and so let's at least try to find a way to make it safe and functional for this upcoming season for our largest spring sport. And um, thank you. Great. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Um, anyone else in the room? No? Online? I'm not seeing any hands. No, oh, great. Uh, so next item is the... Jim, can I just make a very quick announcement. Sure. Just I, I wanted to lift up a couple of things that I have recognized in our school district just very, yeah. very quickly, if I could. First, I wanted to say congratulations to our Montpelier Roxbury mask theater program for an outstanding performance of you're in town and looking over to Lara because she was a key player on the stage. But there were many, many, many students who went into the company and crew. And I just was, I got a chance to see it on Friday and was so impressed at the talent and the commitment of those students. So I wanted to say that and also say thank you, Alara, and your fellow students for, for providing that entertainment for the community. That was a ton of fun. Um, and then I also wanted to offer something that I didn't know existed until just recently um, in my day job today. I had the pleasure and privilege of participating in a webinar in which our several high, of our high school students were also there. The high school's healthy masculinity class was featured in our um, in this webinar I was in. And young men and their teacher, Joe Carroll, uh, led a conversation among business leaders in our state about the expectations of masculinity in our society today and how to foster healthy relationships. 
among themselves and also broad, more broadly among everyone. And once again, I was just so impressed by these young people in our community. I just felt like it was worth using just a little bit of public comment time. Um, very grateful that they have this resource here at our high school, because to me, it seems like a really important part of what we are here to do, which is prepare them for life beyond our schools. So just wanted to acknowledge those two really great things happening in our schools. Awesome. Um, the consent agenda, uh, the consent agenda is essentially kind of small ministerial things that we need to approve, but don't require separate time. It, uh, helps us not be here till 10 every night. Um, and if there is something that board members have questions about, they can pull that out for uh, individual discussion. Um, do I have a motion to prove the consent agenda? Thank you, Scott. Took a while. Uh, do you have a second? Uh, second, with the addition of the co curricular. Right. With, with the addition of the co curriculars. With the addition of the co curriculars, just to clarify? Yes. Um, do you have a second? Second. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Consent agenda passes. On to budget. So, Christina, if you want to, I don't know how you guys want to set up team. physically. We're but... tag teaming this. Yeah, excellent. Anna, I need the capacity to share my screen. Can you make me a co-host, please? I always feel weird talking to Anna. <laughs> there we go. Can you text Jake to tell him more in the cafeteria? Oh, I can be just texting. Um, I don't have to text. Okay. So, in my orca friend, can you um make the pictures disappear on the screen too from the computer? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So here is the draft budget. I just want to remind the board and everybody who's listening that this is the first draft. There will be three drafts to go through after feedback is given from the board. So this is the first draft. There are still lots of numbers that are that are assumptions that we'll talk about in here. There are some that are getting more and more real, like literally, what, an hour ago? <laughs> we got new numbers that are not represented in here because we didn't have enough time to update the slideshow. Um, so new numbers are coming in every single day. It is different from last Wednesday already um, in a good way, in a, in a better way. So uh, so we were able to add some revenue between last Wednesday and this Wednesday. So to no further ado, here's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to do an overview just around the district, the glossary of terms, um, what are unknowns, and then just a budget at a glance because it's the thing everybody wants to get to. Um, we have enrollment protections, we have staffing implications, expenses and revenues going through the capital plan, um, and then the tax rates, and then time for board discussion and uh, public comments after the presentation. I think. I think. We'll ask the board to write down your questions and then save it to the end of the presentation. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Okay, so here's just some district information of the number of students we have and the number of total FTEs or full-time <laughs> equivalents that we have in the school district. Um, these numbers for the student count are from the October 1st student count. So it's just something to keep in mind. They might be slightly different now. Um, However, these are from the October 1st student count. We do have 290 employees, 161 of them are faculty or teachers. Here's some demographic information. Um, anywhere you see less than 11, that's an, because N, 11 is our N size that we cannot report under. So if you see less than 11, then that means we have zero to 11 kids in that category. Uh, and we can't report that exact number because it could be identifiable to a student. So we can't break purple laws here in this presentation. 
You'll notice here that our free and reduced numbers that the board, especially who have seen budget presentations before, those have drastically increased because the state is uh, calculating that in a different way because of the universal free meals. Um, so right now it's called direct certification through Medicaid forms. Is that correct, Christina? Direct yeah. Direct so for other state subsidies, then they automatically qualify for free and reduced. So that that enables us to not have parents having to report out and send us back forms. Um, so that's a number now that's given to us by the state. Um, <laughs> So if you have a handout, you only have the odd pages. I apologize. For <laughs> I apologize for that little snafu. Double <laughs> That's okay. That's why we have the projection up here. So hopefully not the good stuff is missing. <laughs> we tried and you can't get it out all on the screen. I tried to raise the screen, I couldn't. So I apologize. Uh, the context. So that said, if people want to like scoot your yeah, chairs up chair. closer, it's fine. go for it. Cozy. Yeah. It's fine. Uh, the context here, some budget themes. So we want in any of our budgets, we want to support our theory of growth, which we'll talk about in a minute, while still being sensitive to the tax implications for our community. The statewide factors that we're dealing with is, of course, Act 127, something we've been talking about for quite some time now. That's the new pupil waiting law that went into the will go into effect for FY25's budget. We have an anticipated dollar yield of $9,452. Um, that is always going to be anticipated in budget presentations because it's set in law in May or June by the legislature, but they're the tax commissioner letter that came out on November 30th this year um, gives us that anticipated amount. The estimated common level of appraisal, of course, what your um, house is worth versus what it's appraised at, that is still an assumption or an estimate at this time, but we have it on good authority that our estimates are pretty good. Um, we have health rates, health care um, increases of 16.4%. That's a statewide bargaining number, so we have no influence over this. It's statewide, but that increases our health uh, benefits to by almost $400,000 in this budget. And then our local and local factors is that we do have a decreasing student enrollment. It's not decreasing precipitously, but it's decreasing. So it's a downward trend. So some district drivers here. Our board worked very hard over the summer and in the early fall on coming on three um, focus areas. One is academic achievement for all students. Another is safety, inclusion, inclusion, and belonging for every member of our community and a commitment to open communication with our community. Uh, so you see the budget will reflect particularly those first two indicators of board focus. I mentioned our theory of growth before. We've been working with this theory of growth for the last few years. So if you've been to budget meetings, this is not new. The traffic might be due because they haven't changed it a year or two ago. Um, but we're working on the premise of four uh, for values in our system. We want to build limitless futures for every learner. That means when they graduate from our system, that they have any choice available to them that they want to go after. Um, and in order to do that, we know that we need to have collective responsibility and collaborative practices because educating children is complicated. So nobody, no one person can do that on their own. We need to have formalized essential learning. So we're positive what it is that we need to teach students and a student in one class does not get different content than a student the, that learning the same amount, same stuff in a different class with a different teacher. We want a timely system to enrich, intervene and remediate, remediate basically saying that any kid is the learning is the constant, not the time it takes to get that learning, but the learning is the constant around our formalized essential learning and that we want high quality instruction in every single class, classroom. So typically in budget conversations, I break these four down to show what, but where in the budget, particularly like money, the board is focusing on and staffing and things like that. We're not adding any staff this year. However, um, you'll see our four pillars here around staffing, professional development and leadership. And as we were sharing this presentation with our leadership team today, it was just massive snaps around the table for this chart. Last year, we couldn't put any links to show evidence of this work. 
And now it's absolutely full of links that people can click on to see exactly what we mean when we say multi-tiered system of support. The definitions are in our on our website under that at link. So people can see it. They can see pictures of our intervention team um, and where they work and what their focus is. We can you can see definitions of tier three and tier two instruction with remediation and intervention. You can see our assessment plan. You can see our curriculum and how we develop it. All of that is up on our website now through a tremendous amount of work by the team in the back there. So um, I applaud their work most definitely and thank them profusely. You can also see links to the professional learning that will still be going on through FY25. So that is a budget implication. We pay for that, right? <laughs> um, and in terms of you know, different tiers and that kind of thing, there are people and human resources that the board is committed in budgetary and past budgets to ensure that we have the human resource capacity to make this happen. Um, so a lot of development in these areas with evidence towards growth that people can click on. All right, so let's get to the budget in particular. Here's just a glossary of terms. Um, when presenting a budget, somebody said the other day, I think I said this in the last meeting, that uh, don't use buzzwords. It's nearly impossible to talk about education finance in Vermont without using buzzwords. So hopefully this is not an odd page. Hopefully you have this thing keep it. You have this one? Good, okay, thanks, Tina. <laughs> you can have this kind of uh, dog-eared so you can refresh back to it. The general fund you'll see in our budget is the main operating fund of the school district. It's what we need in order to, um, to operate. The capital plan is a separate entity. Currently, it's being voted on as a separate article in, uh, on town meeting day. We're actually checking to see if it has to be a separate article because we do a similar thing with, in terms of money transfer with food service, and that's not a separate article. So we're not sure why the capital fund is. Um, so we're just checking on that. It will be a separate article for this year, but it's something that that is uh, different. The capital fund is for long-term planned facility needs. Education spending is our total budget less our non-tax revenues, such as federal and state grants like Title I and Title II, as well as locally generated revenues like tuition when a student is tuitioned into our schools and interest on any kind of account that we might have. Long-term weighted average daily membership, LTWADM. This is the new per pupil weights. Um, we're probably going to call them weighted pupils during this presentation because that's a mouthful. So we will probably continue with weighted pupils if it's okay with the board. Although in the, in the presentation, it says LTWADM. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's our average daily membership and it's multiplied. This is, this is the weights that we talk about. The property dollar yield um, is the estimated amount districts have to pay, spend per pupil to have an equalized tax rate of a dollar. That's a mouthful. I'm still not quite sure that's exactly the best way to describe it, but that's what it is. If any of our two board members in the tax department want to make that make a go of layman's terms there, you're welcome to. But the bottom line is that in a good economy, there's a higher yield number and that lowers our tax rates. If the yield goes down, that increases our tax rates. And it's not something that we have control over in the district. It's set by law in the spring. We do have that anticipated property or dollar yield now. And then the common level of appraisal is your appraised value on a property versus the market value. Um, higher market value equals CLA under 100% equals a higher tax rate. As, as close as the CLA is to 100% or over, that equals a lower tax rate. And again, this is not something that we have any control over. The dollar yield and the CLA, however, do drastically impact the school tax base. So, the, so each pupil, when we're talking about our weighted pupils, we're not talking about individual students in individual seats. What we're talking about is that each student, um, depending on some identifying factors, uh, what grade they're in, uh, whether they are English language learner, whether they are um, living in poverty, they they add different weights, which you see there in the long-term weighted average. You see the weights in parentheses after each category. This is what's changed in Act 127. 
the weights were much different now. So a student who has limited English proficiency at the elementary level is that student is multiplied by 2.49, for instance. Budget unknown still. The tax factors that we don't know are final LTW or weighted pupils. We still don't know that. We just got an updated number literally an hour ago before this presentation. It is not what's in this presentation, but we do have an updated one. It is still, we still don't believe it's correct. So, so we're still there, but we do have an updated one. It did go in the right direction at least. Uh, and our common level of appraisal, we're still using an estimate. The revenues, we don't know what our transportation aid is going to be at this point. And in terms of expenses, we still don't know what our career center six semester average is. And we are currently in negotiations with our AFSME unit, which are custodians, technologists, and administrative assistants. So we don't know what the outcome of those contract negotiations will be. And Christina, I'm gonna hand it over to you for budget at a glance. Those of you that don't know me, I'm just Nice and loud so they can hear you behind you. <laughs> um, so since we last met, we had a lot of good news on the revenue side. We were looking at having to use a lot of fund balance, and we were able to reduce that because we increased our revenues on the special education side, and I'll walk through that with you. Um, budget at a glance, you're looking at three columns here. The first column is FY24, the final budget after the yield was set and after the CLA was adjusted for the reappraisal that was done in Montpelier. Um, so in the second column is FY24 budget if Act 127 were in place. We needed to run through this exercise so we could compare apples to apples um, to get to the tax rate. So the column that we're going to look at is FY25 budget draft one. Currently, our budget um, with the capital plan is thirty-two million two hundred one thousand. That is um, an eleven and a half percent increase from the current year. That brings us to the long-term weighted average daily membership. So we're going to call that pupils. Currently. Um, our pupils are 1,821, and that is the weighted version. And like Libby said, we just got new numbers on that an hour ago. So your next version, you'll you'll see that number increase. That gives us an ed spending per pupil of 14,600. Um, currently, like Libby said, the dollar yield is set at 9,452. That would give us an equalized residential tax rate of $1.54. That's the number that's capped at 5%. So with that cap, we're looking at $1.33. And that's in red on the presentation online, if you'd like to see it. This, Jen, just this budget at a glance, just to say it right now, even though the board sees an increase to the general budget than we showed you last Wednesday, we are under the 10% per pupil increase. Um, we're currently hovering around 9% right now, which gives us a little wiggle room if some of these estimates come in, not in our favor. So in terms of enrollment projections, um, you the board can see several years of where we were to where we're going and that our numbers are dropping slightly uh, year to year. We've risen and then we've fallen <laughs> from 2015. In terms of class sizes, this is something we wanted to point out to the board. We will be uh, suggesting to the board to reduce in force a K-6 licensure te licensed teacher this budget season. You see that in, marked in green where we currently have five fourth grade teachers at Union Elementary School. So we are suggesting to the board because of class sizes to reduce by a K-6 licensed teacher. What the board should not hear there is that we reduce a union elementary teacher because it's based on licensure category, not on school building. So it's a K-6 um, person there. Tip we've done this in the past and typically that's solved through some sort of um, person deciding they're gonna go to a different a different employer, <laughs> typically, that, or a retirement, one of the two. So uh, that's typically how that, that particular RIF is taken care of. 
If it's not that way, then it goes to seniority. I highlighted or had Christina highlight the um, U K through four teachers at Union Elementary School for the 24, 25 school year and the 25, 26 school year, because this will be a place that the board will be looking at in future years to continually to make rifts because our class sizes should enrollments the enrollment trends continue the way they are currently going. Our class sizes at Union are getting very small and your class size policy dictates where those classrooms should be. And there are considerable opportunities there to continue to look at our, our K-6 licensed teachers um, without breaking class size policy at all. So we have a lot of room to maneuver over the next course, next years. And as we've pointed out, in the past, what, six board meetings, this is not a one-year challenge with Act 127, it's a five-year challenge with Act 127. So this is a place where the board will probably be looking um, in, the, in the next few years. We just wanted to highlight it in this budget. This is the enrollment projections for Roxbury. In Montpelier, we use, um, we have somebody who can, who does projections for us. At Roxbury, we simply take the kids and move them down a year. Um, we don't have that same same kind of count. So um, if we have six third graders in 2022-23, we have six third, fourth graders in 23-24, there's nothing really scientific about it unless we gain or lose students and we know we have um, at the October 1 count. And so we make adjustments with actual bodies and seats there. So this is just another way to show the enrollment um, on a line graph that does show the, the decreasing enrollment over time on the top line in red. Um, and you can see when different historical dates that influenced student enrollment happened for board members who haven't been here for a while. So in terms of this budget, what we are suggesting to the board in this draft, we had to make some additions. So ESSER funding is ending on, in September, 2024. So we added 2.55 FTE and in intervention paid for through ESSER, ARP ESSER grant funding, um, which is ending. So we're, we're adding those positions into the budget to help support our theory of growth around timely systems to intervene, remediate and enrich. The RVS after school program, it, we are losing an after school grant that is currently paying for most of that program, not all of it, but most of it. Um, and so we're, we need to add 1.5 FTE to RBS after school. However, as Christina is going to note later on in the presentation that we need to ask parents to pay for that service next year. And so there'll be a corresponding revenue for that piece. So it's not a, it's not a budget add in terms of an expense. Um, but it is going to be an addition. And social work, we've been paying for 1.0 FTE social work out of our Medicaid fund balance for several years now because our Medicaid fund balance was quite large um, and we've used that up. So that social work position in order to support students with social emotional learning needs to be moved into the local, uh, local budget. And then there's a new payroll tax from the legislature that's 0.44%. Um, that needs to be added to our salaries and benefits page, or our salaries and benefits, rather. In terms of reductions in force, we're suggesting to reduce AFSCME's uh, support staff position, 1.0 FTE. It's that position is currently not filled. A K-6 licensure, as I talked about before, because of low enrollment, 1.0 FTE. The RVS pre-K position, which is 0.5 FTE because of low enrollment, that is currently unfilled as well. The RVS library media has a technology piece to it, which is 0.2. Um, so it, right currently it's a 0.6 position. 0.2 of it is dedicated to like a technology class that no other school has. Um, and so we re are suggesting reducing that position by just 0.2 not taking the library piece away, but take the technology piece away. Um, and MHS Science, the district-wide sustainability position is 0.2 FTE. Um, and when you reduce the, the district-wide sustainability, we have too many science teachers. So that would be a, a MHS Science rep of 2.2, or I'm sorry, 0.2 FTE. Budget expenditures, Christina, take it. 
right from here on out we're going to look at the total budget so it's the third line on this page <clears throat> so expenses by school this is another place where the board can see um, the costs starting to really skyrocket at Union Elementary School. In a, um, because, and this is largely because of the very small class sizes. Um, so, so this number, if, if we were to right size those classrooms um, over the next few years, that would bring it down to where Main Street Middle School and, and Montpelier High School is. There's room to maneuver there for Union Elementary School. That's one of the big differences between the Union Elementary School number and the Roxbury number. There isn't room to maneuver in the Roxbury number by reducing staff there um, without other drastic measures. So um, there's a little bit difference between those two numbers in, in how we are seeing them, but that Union number has drastically increased in my time here, certainly. Um, and right now our class sizes are very small there. All right now we're going to look at the expenses by program. It's a few different ways to look at expenses. You can look at it by category or by program. We're going to start with program and then I'll walk through the category. Then we'll get into the revenue side where all the good news is. <laughs> um, so general education, the proposed budget is an increase of 9.64. And a, what you're going to hear through all of this is it's a lot to do with the health insurance increases and um, contract negotiation. So in general education, we're looking at a 9% increase, mostly caused by health insurance premiums, contract negotiations, and the added tester position. In special education, we're looking at a 29% increase, budget over budget. This is also health insurance, contract negotiations. We had to increase our specialized transportation um, and professional services. We're also looking at an increase uh, to OT and PT service. Just services. occupational therapy and physical therapy. Buzzwords. <laughs> All right, our career center uh, tuition, we're anticipating little change in the FTE there. Under student support, which is our nurse, guidance, social worker, and speech, we're looking at about an 18% increase, uh, mostly due to health insurance and contract negotiations. Our staff support services, so this is library, tech, curriculum and our professional development. We're looking at about an 8% increase here. Uh, the school board and superintendent area, we're looking at a decrease. We decreased professional development and we had a decrease in our legal services. Uh, principal office and the special services administration, a small increase of 4%, mostly caused by health insurance. In the business office, uh, there's an increase, of course, in health insurance. Um, there's an increase in our audit contract. We go out to bid for that. And then added professional services. Under buildings and grounds, there's a small increase here, 2%. Um, that's mostly caused by heating and electricity costs. Under safety, there's a decrease here. We had some one-time expenses in this current year that we won't need next year. In transportation, we have an increase. We have a new contract. Uh, I believe it's a three-year contract. And under debt service, we're seeing a decrease there in our interest payments. Those are all the bonds that we have outstanding. And then the fund transfer um, to cover the anticipated food service deficit. The next slide um, shows you just a different way of looking at it. <laughs> um, the percentages. And the next slide shows you a year-to-year -year comparison in those programs. This slide is expenses by category. So this breaks out salaries from each of those programs that we just talked about, and it breaks out the benefits of each of those programs. So overall salaries are increasing 10%. So this reflects our actual staffing that we know about um, as of today. <laughs> the benefits, so this is a 24% increase. Uh, we're increasing the HRA usage percentage. We were um, budgeting for 75% usage and we're seeing that go up. So 
85%. And we have the new payroll tax. Professional services. Um, so this is some professional services, meaning paying someone to do something, i.e. like our legal contract and that sort of thing. That's going up by 6%. Um, our 504 and SPED requirements are increasing. And then there's just a normal year-to-year -year increase for services. Purchase services, there's a decrease. A lot of this is the building-based decreases that the principals put forward. Contracted services is a 14% increase, and this is also um, related to SPED requirements and then normal year-to-year -year increases. Um, this would be where our increase to transportation is. Supplies, technology, and books. Again, this is a decrease based on building-based budget. Our equipment, there's a, a small increase um, of $16,000 for facility needs. And that is separate from what our capital plan does. I'll, there's another a separate slide for that. And then our fund transfer to food service. This chart just shows you a different view of your salaries, benefits, professional services, how it makes up our total budget. And the next slide is a year-to-year -year comparison. <laughs> and on to our revenue. So this is where we got a lot of good news over the last week. Since I've seen you two weeks, not week, <laughs> yesterday. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, the top uh, few rows um, is our tuition. So we can get tuition from towns that tuition out either elementary or high school. So we do see some of that. We also get private tuition. So parents that live, let's say, in our neighboring town, Berlin or Barrie, and they want to send a third child here, they can pay a private tuition. Um, we also receive a small tuition for preschoolers that choose to come to our program after the um, the universal pre-K bill was passed. So we're not going to see too much changes there, I, I don't anticipate. Um, the next highlight here, I would go down to the local revenue, the after-school program that Libby referred to earlier. We're adding $100,000 there as um, parent payments to help supplement that program. The next highlight I would go to is the prior year surplus. Um, you'll see $165,000 was added to the already committed $400,000. The next big number that you're seeing there is the Ed spending grant. So this is the money made up from the Ed fund and also property taxes. The high Highlighted piece online, <laughs> um, Tech Center on behalf. This is based on the six semester average, so we're just waiting for some final information there. The next couple lines, the merger grant, the merger incentive grant, which used to be called the small schools grant. Montpelier Roxbury still qualifies for that because um, they did merge. So you get that for as long as the legislature lets you. <laughs> um, Let's see, the next piece that I bring your attention to is the SPED reimbursement, the extraordinary re reimbursement. This is where we saw a big jump, an $80,000 jump, which helped us not have to cut as much as we were talking about last week. The next one I'll bring your attention to is the SPED Census Block Grant. That went up $187,000. So again, that helped offset what we thought we needed to do on the expenditure side. Then going down, you'll see the IDEAB grant, and you'll see it says it matches grant expenses. So all of these grants are reimbursable grants. Whatever we spend, we get reimbursed. They do give us estimates of what we're going to be allocated each year, but we don't typically know that until about May. So we're putting in estimates here. Uh, this pie chart just shows you that consider the education spending, how much of your revenues make come from um, the Ed Fund and property taxes. 
The next slide is our capital plan. And FY25, we're planning, this is the $270,000 that you'll see on your tax rate calculation um, slide that we have kind of scattered all through this presentation. Um, we're planning on doing UES windows and Main Street uh, window replacement, each 50, roughly $50,000 a piece. We are looking at some district-wide limited roof repair, um, one being this room <laughs> right above us. Okay, this, the next slide you saw earlier, we're just going to run through it again um, to highlight the craft 5%. So we have our general budget at the top, $31 million, uh, the, plus the capital plan that you vote on on a separate article. So we're looking at a $32 million budget. Our offsetting revenues are five. Point six million. So that's the tuition, the interest, um, the special ed reimbursement. So that brings you to your ed education spending. That's the amount of money that you have to draw in from the ed fund and property taxes. <laughs> Currently, our pupil count is 1,821. That number did go up an hour ago. So I look forward to presenting that to you <laughs> at a later date. Um, bringing our ed spending per pupil to 14,600. We're using an estimate on the dollar yield that came out on the commissioner's letter of December 1st, which is 9,452. And not talking about the cap right now, that would bring you to an equalized residential tax rate of $1.54, but because we are capped at 5%, it will be $1.33, which compares to the first column, that is the FY24 final budget after the yield was set and after the CLA was adjusted for reappraisal. The common level of appraisal is still an estimate at this time. I'm not sure, I'm looking at Jill, I'm not sure when we'll hear that. The statutory deadline is January 1st, so we're trying really hard to make it. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> That's okay. My whole life right now. She was ready for it. <laughs> so January, after January 1st, I think our next meeting is January 3rd. So I, this will look a lot different. <laughs> well, maybe not too much different. So the next slide, this is the impact. So we wanted to show if you live in Montpelier, Roxbury, um, well, we've seen this slide before. It used to say a hundred thousand dollar home bed or three hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, and three hundred thousand. We wanted to increase that to kind of the real picture. So we start out with a, t a property value of two hundred thousand dollars. So currently, your tax bill is two thousand two hundred forty dollars. Um, with this proposed budget, it would increase by four hundred thirty five dollars annually to bring you to two thousand six hundred seventy five. This is an odd page. Oh, boy. Uh, and then you can see for Roxbury, it would be, be $130, um, 196 for a $300,000 house, and 261 for your tax bill of $5,480. Um, and uh, just a little side note here um, Montpelier has 1,895 homesteads. And about 66% of those ones said pay property taxes based on income sensitivity. Roxbury has 222 homesteads and about 63% qualify for income sensitivity. And this is based on 2022 data from uh, the Vermont Department of Tax and Does anyone want to talk about my tax Here people? <laughs> my tax people want to jump in. <laughs> The next slide uh, just shows historically the tax rates. <laughs> the next slide is our non-residential tax rate calculation and our budget does not have an impact on this rate. Um, the CLA does, and this is for second homes, rental properties, um, commercial properties. This is what their tax rate looks like. I'm anticipating this probably a change. So it's discussion and question time. And just a reminder to everybody, our upcoming meetings, we do have a meeting next 
Wednesday, where a second draft will take feedback into consideration from the board and add in new numbers that we receive. Um, so next Wednesday, the board will get the second draft of the presentation. January 3rd is budget public forum, which is kind of like a typical board meeting where a third draft will be presented. Um, and then on the 17th, the board will need to uh, approve, vote to approve the budget that will, and the warning that goes to the voters. Um, so Christina can get all of that ready in time for the town clerks. Um, we do have a budget informational meeting on March 4th and on March 5th is of course town meeting day where people vote. So open up to discussion. Yes. So it's to, to the board first, and then we can open it up to public comment. Um, questions or comments? Maria? Um, I have a question. When we were going through the changes in staffing, you mentioned that we have too many science teachers. Can you uh, clarify what that means? I'm so sorry. we have a, we've got a lower here that's extremely oh. low. Could you speak? Yeah, so she asked about that, the science. The science rep. So uh, we have a district sustainability coordinator who does not currently teach classes for point two of the contract. Um, we're suggesting to the board to rip that position. Uh, point, two. point two of that yeah. position, just point two of that position. Um, and based on student enrollment projections, that leaves too many FTE in the science department. So it becomes a point to rip in the science department. So I, I had the same question and we did get a letter about this too. Um, it's it's easy to concur with rifts that don't actually impact someone or it's a vacant position or there's low enrollment, but that one really sticks out because that would be cutting an individual salary for someone that we already have. And that feels crummy. <laughs> there's a couple on there that would do that. Okay. That's not the only position that does that. Yeah, and we definitely tried to minimize that to the extent possible, but um, we could not totally. Yeah. 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 Oh, sorry. I, um, I said we tried to minimize the extent to which it impacted <clears throat> uh, positions where people were occupying the positions, but you could not eliminate that. So, and I, you know, that's a, a hard reality, but um, we did try to minimize it to the extent uh, practicable. I think um, it is important for us to remember that, you know, obviously we all understand this, but just reminding us that all these cuts are going to have impacts and especially any cuts in student face facing positions. I mean, I think I'm just stating the obvious here, but teachers are not just givers of information. They're also just also, you know, lifelines for students a lot of the time and really important to our lives in a lot of different ways. And especially if that they're still having a hard time hearing oh, that. Yeah. Oh, really yeah. the light. Maybe stand. Right. I don't know. I can shout. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Yeah. 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 We're not in the library. That's, I think, <laughs> Morgan. That one. Um, the teachers the are direct instruction yeah. with students, and they're more than just I'm givers just, of information. I think it's Thank you. Especially if. It's a, a science department position or any core classes. It's just that is going to have a real impact on students. And I think it's important that we remember that. I understand that we have to cut the budget, but that yeah. one is particularly painful to my school experience. And I think my classmates, because even if we supposedly have too many science teachers, they're all people who make a real difference in students' lives on a daily basis. Yeah, no, thank you, Mira. I had a related question about the point twos. There's two point two positions in the um, staffing cuts. 
And it sounds like they might both impact people who are already part-time, is that? Uh, well, yeah, they do both impact already part-timers. So I just wonder about the challenge of retaining people who are already part-time and then cut, making an additional cut to that position and if we're likely to retain those people or not. And if that was taken into consideration in the point twos. My other question is sort of like, I know that it's uncomfortable to talk, to talk about actual dollar amounts, but I'm wondering with that point four, the point two at Roxbury and the point two here, if um, that amount of money potentially could, I mean, we're gonna be talking about unencumbering the track funds later, possibly if the board agreed to give more money towards the budget this year, if we could wait on those, you know, like could we offset the cuts to staffing by taking more money out of the fund balance? But I, but I have no way of knowing like what those point twos represent in actual dollars. So the the point twos together, Christina can I don't have the Christina can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's approximately forty five thousand dollars. Forty five. Forty five thousand dollars, yes. And when we were considering which places to reduce, the one of the drivers was does the position work towards our focus areas? So directly, um, these two did not. Um, so we, so that is two areas where we were looking at um, the technology piece at RVS is not something that's needed at RVS. Um, it's not a class that currently happens at RVS, is my understanding. I'm looking at Shannon just to make sure I don't say anything that's not that's off. So the teachers will call that position in for extra support. Um, or maybe like a special subject, but it, every other school, including UBS, is just part of the librarian's position as a library media specialist, but also be integrating tech into a library lesson. So it's still the same subject, but it already happened. Does that make sense? So at this moment, we're a little redundant. At Roxbury. Um, the other thing I just like to remind the board that one of the things we cannot predict is what will happen with staffing, right? We just don't know. Yeah. Because there's too many unknowns that happen during hiring season. And as I've said a couple of times in the last couple of weeks, um, people surprise us all the time <laughs> during during staffing at the end towards the spring and decisions they make. So you can't predict what one person is going to do and the influence that it has right. on that. Um, I would also remind the board that this is not a one-year problem, it's a five-year problem. So while, yeah, I'm sure we can pull $40,000 from the fund balance, the board will be having to rip positions over the next five years that do have people in them. And that is very hard to do. And believe me, I know that because I am the person sitting across from them telling them this. So I understand that that dilemma and I understand how, how hard that is more than anybody probably in this room. <laughs> Um, however, it is a reality that we are going to have to face um, in the next five years or so. And these are not bad teachers. These are wonderful teachers. This is no thought on the, the quality of the teacher at all. Um, it's what we need to really focus in on across the next five years and this year. What are our goals? Do our positions match it? Are we overstaffed? Are we understaffed in those areas? And what are we going to do to make those decisions? We're going to have to make hard decisions. That is, that's unavoidable right now. So yes, we can cover it with forty thousand dollars somewhere else. We do not need the district-wide sustainability coordinator to reach our goals, or the RVS technology position um, to reach our goals. And we have very low enrollment for the other two places. And do you believe, like, if a position is 0. 0.6 and now it's going to be 0. 0.4 and we lose the person because it was cut down to that level, do you feel that you'd be able to replace, like, hire a 0. 0.4 person? Right? Like, is there a danger in losing a 0. 0.4 science teacher at the high school? And would that then potentially put us into a problem where we don't have enough 
I mean, speaking from we experience, currently like, do not believe that will be that would be a problem. Okay, because like we've had trouble. Like my son was in a Spanish class that was being mm -hmm. taught by BTVLC, and it was not a, a high quality experience. And so it worries me, you know, having like not being able to fill a position like that because we're talking about point two that feels like above and beyond. But if it turns into also losing a point four. That would be worrisome. There are situations that we have with our FTE and our science department that does not make me worried about that. Okay. The RVS library media is something different. Perhaps we would have a struggle finding a point for library teacher if that person were to quit. Because it, if we have a teach open teaching position that's 1.0 at Roxbury, it's hard to fill. So that's neither here nor there really, because it's hard to hire for Roxbury regardless of what the FTE is. Yeah. I have a few that are just a little bit more of like, help us understand what we're looking at. Yep. Um, so last week, the board was trying to give direction on how to get to about $800,000 worth of cuts slash additional revenue sources. Um, what is the what where are we at with that now just that bigger that bigger picture number because i don't think it's eight hundred thousand anymore given that we have this new revenue these new revenue numbers right we didn't increase the budget by the eight hundred thousand because the revenue came in higher right so what have we decreased our projected budget by from the version last week yeah Right. Do you want me to look that up and ask? I can. I can tell you before we got the revenue numbers, we were projecting that we needed thirty-two million in order to come in close, and we're a hundred thousand dollars below that. But our numbers—it's hard to say, Mia, because our estimates change so much. Right. Okay. Right. And there's so many factors that have changed. Um. Mm -hmm. So. Originally, it was around two million, and then it went to eight hundred thousand. And right then, like Thursday of last week, after our board meeting, because that's when our special education revenue came in, it went to five twenty five. And so it, we're changing it as we work through the numbers. But what? So in other words, we never did the whole accounting for the whole budget after we start getting these revenue numbers. In. Right. We just start working with the numbers we have. Right. So and and getting below the ten percent. Right, per pupil. So it's generally about 525,000 that we're cutting from what we would have originally needed to spend in about FY25, that. about that. Yeah. Okay. And would more cuts significantly reduce the tax rate from $1.33 and $1.37? Hard to tell because we did increase our pupil count. So, with that, uh, we increased it by 12. Did I misunderstand the question? Yeah, yeah. if we made no. more cuts to our general budget with a tax rate decrease significantly. I don't think so, because we're already, without the 5% cap, we're over that now. So we'd have to cut down Jake's got it. to oh. get to 5%, right? Yeah, it's it's an extremely weird year. Yeah. Um, not like we're used to. Um, our, even if we cut like a million bucks, our tax rate is still going to be a dollar thirty-four. Okay, because of the cap, we're going right. to cap. And and if we if we fall under the five percent, don't we protect the five percent going forward? That's what, true. Yes. Too. Yeah. Yes. Ten, so it's, it's almost like a old blocks of the below ten percent per pupil from last year and above the five percent in order to be a cap. Be capped. It's like that Goldilocks area. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you say is there's no reason to cut more. Than we are currently projecting to cut. It's quite a bad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's because we're in. I was what I'm inferring from what you're saying. We are in the zone. Yeah, yeah. We're at nine percent, about nine percent per pupil increase. Yeah, weighted pupil increase, and so and we're still above the five percent for a tax rate increase. So we're capped at five percent for equalized tax rate increase. Equal, right. So we're at twenty one percent. 
equalized residential tax rate without the cap. So somebody, the Ed Fund possibly, needs to make up that 15% difference, yeah. 16% difference, right. if you want to speak to that. Yeah, that's basically true. Um, the other very weird thing this year, you know, our tax rates are going up about 22 cents, which is a lot. And in a normal time, you know, a community might see that and say, oh my gosh, this is terrible. You know, school board, please do something about this. But we're so far above the 5% cap that it's like, you know, they're, they're, you couldn't, couldn't even get it down to something right. smaller. Right. That's helpful. Thank you. My other follow-up question is on the new-ish revenue around special education that we learned about on Thursday. Is that one-time money or is that something that we can anticipate over the course of the next five years? Okay. <laughs> Kaisu, come on up. So our, <laughs> our census block is, correct me if I'm wrong, our census block is based on our student count. So our special ed census block. Right, it's based on the total number of students we have in the district, not the number of students that we have on um, IEPs. Okay. Um, the extraordinary cost uh, revenue that we have, that is based on any student that goes over $66,000. If their cost goes over that, once we're at that, uh, any cost over $66,000, we get reimbursed at 90% or 95%. So we get reimbursed at 95%, but Act, what was the other one? Act 173 changed special, special ed funding across the board. And so the extraordinary reimbursement, like she said, anything over 66,000, we get reimbursed at 95%. But they had a second calculation that I cannot understand. The agency of education puts it together. And we're actually incentivized, incentivized <laughs> to spend more on special ed students that are outplaced or go over that $66,000. We okay. get more money, more revenue for that. Okay. And that's where these increases on our revenue slide 27 of 80,000 80, more and 187,000 more. Those are the new numbers that you received on Thursday. And so are, is that, a, I guess what I'm trying to make sense of is one of the things that we've determined it's not very smart of us to do since this is a five, maybe more longer year situation we're in is use one-time funds to handle ongoing costs. So what I just am trying to figure out is these new numbers, the newish, $80,000 and $187,000, can we expect that we're gonna see that same amount in FY26 and FY roughly? No, not, not necessarily. It's not, so it's not those, a guarantee. If okay. those ex extraordinary students, if they age out of the program, if uh -huh. they don't need the services any longer, uh -huh. um, that could change our revenue drastically in those areas. And I would say philosophically, I would love that number to go down because yeah. that means that the systems that we're building in our schools are able to meet the needs of more kids. So right. that we're not needing to send them to um, independent schools that are, you know, therapy. Yeah. Not to say that all of them, will, but that as we continue to develop our systems in our schools, which I think are rocking it, quite frankly, um, I, I think that that number, I hope that number of kids that then we're feeling like we don't have what we need in our schools will decrease, yep. and then that would go down. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, Jim, can I go? <laughs> Um, yeah, I just have a context question on the 16% increase in healthcare costs because it's so significant and it's also unavoidable. And um, I'd also just based on the op-ed that you had shared, Jim, it sounds like that that is somewhat possible, like negotiable at the state level. So I feel like it would be helpful for folks to understand in terms of like why that's out of control and where the state can kind of come into that or there can be advocacy around that. And if we can anticipate that that is a, will not be a consistently seen increase over time. Well, I, I think, okay. So several it, years ago, yeah, um, we used to negotiate directly with the union to provide healthcare directly. Uh, there was kind of a, a grand bargain struck by people at a higher pay grade than us all that 
this would be done on a statewide level with all teachers. Uh, and the idea there was that if you had more people in the pool, there'd be leverage, you could bring prices down. That has just not been the case, not even close to the case. And 16% is unfortunately kind of in the ballpark of the type of cost increases we've been seeing pretty much on a regular basis. So, um, so the state bargains for that. Um, it, <laughs> I mean, like granted healthcare costs are going up everywhere. I mean, we have a, we have a broken healthcare system that is like no, no mystery to anyone. So I think there are factors at the national scale that are driving that. Um, you know, that's that said, you know, we don't know what it would be if we didn't have statewide bargaining, but certainly with statewide bargaining, it is it is a cost that is increasing at a vastly higher rate than inflation. Um, and we can't control it. We're just stuck with it. And and I think, you know, seeing how focused Congress is on fixing our health care system, I, I'm expecting that we'll probably see it for a bit longer. I have another question, yes. just a different topic though, on the staffing piece. So what we were talking about just previously was you know, kind of losing existing teachers and then we have situations where we have um, positions that are not currently filled. Um, and I'm curious about the RBS pre-K or just like any unfilled position, that one in particular, I think we hear a lot in education, the importance of zero to five and early education has the potential for lifelong impacts and, and more positive outcomes. So I'm curious if, you know, and I know that there was a lot of active surveying done, you know, that went out by Tina um, at RVS and the uh, Roxbury community to kind of make that determination that we did not have um, the numbers um, for this coming year. And I'm curious, you know, as I'm looking on the screen and I'm definitely seeing some parents of some young kids out in Roxbury that are going to be pre-K eligible um, upcoming. And is that something that will be kind of reviewed on an annual basis um, that could be changed in, in according to need. Um, if and it, regardless, you know, of, of where that lies, you know, in for RVS I, parents, Roxbury parents, what, how can they anticipate getting access to preschool education? Like, could they also come into the Montpelier pre-K program? I don't know kind of what its capacity is or how full that is, but I'm just, I would love for those folks to know what their options might be if we move forward with this budget without a pre-K program at RBS. So anybody can under Act 166. Yeah. Yep. So we pay tuition for a certain number of hours of pre-K that any Roxbury family can, can have us pay for. Um, they just have to enroll with mm -hmm. us. Um, as can any Montpelier family, any any family with a pre-K age student, their child does not need to go to the school. They can go to a different pre-K and get that a certain number of hours to be paid for. Um, and that's what had to happen this year because we couldn't hire, we didn't find somebody to fill that position. Um, so it, while RVS pre-K is in the budget right now in FY24, we had zero ap applicants for that. So we had, we around late April, early May, we started telling families about that so that they could find a position in a different pre-K, um, which there are a lot of them books Northfield. Um, they can certainly apply into Montpelier schools. There's usually a wait list there. Um, so, but any family with a pre-K age student has money under Act 166 that we pay for, it's the pre-K tuition uh, to go for a certain number of hours. So from the surveying of the community, we had about four families who said, yes, I'd like a spot um, for four kids. And then a few families who said, if you offer it full day every day, then I'm in. We're not, it's not a full day every day program. So um, that would be a drastic increase rather than a reduction. Mm -hmm. um, so given Montpelier and Roxbury are in the same school district, would uh, Roxbury be able to almost kind of get seniority in terms of, because it's right, I mean, first the pre-K program in Montpelier satisfies the need in Montpelier. It so doesn't satisfy the need in Montpelier. The wait list is-, is Okay, huge. so there's a yeah. significant wait list. Yeah. Okay, okay. And then in terms of that position, will kind of the community be resurveyed 
um, you know, each year to establish if there is a, a need for the program? We certainly can. The challenge is, is that hiring. Yeah. I mean, and, and hiring high quality pre-K teachers across the state, regardless of yeah. whether it's in public school or private school, is a challenge right now. Yep. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the challenge. And if we we promise something that we put it back in the budget and then we can't hire somebody by what date, you know, May, yeah. June, and then slots get closed up. So mm -hmm. we yes, we can do that and it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank because you. Because I don't want to promise something that we can't deliver on. Yep. Because of a hire. Mm -hmm. Can I just clarify on that all the one family oh, sorry. hours don't yeah. So there is an interest that they get it. Eight to eleven is not that helpful. Absolutely. And that's really the thing more than just the yep. can't the thing Yep. Okay. Yep. Thanks for that very Shannon. Emma. Um, so I had to miss um the last meeting. And but I did watch it. <laughs> um but I still wasn't 100% clear on, so when you had sent out the um, the survey about like, what is the breakdown percentage wise, like that the board would wanna signal to you for um, cuts. And I'm just not sure like what happened in this budget proposal to like the busing or facilities or school-based budgets. So the board gave us the direction that last week to not touch transportation. Um, so that wasn't in there. Facilities is an interesting one because when, so we, we decreased facilities by a hundred thousand dollars and Andrew can probably speak to this better, but when Andrew and Christina went into the budget to discover, you know, to, to find where they were going to find that money, um, they realized that there were things in Andrew's budget still that we were going to get insurance money from, from the flood, or we could get insurance money from, from the flood. So for instance, this basement stored a lot of furniture. Um, and so we're going to get money for that furniture. So uh, Andrew's furniture line could be reduced as a expenditure. However, we're getting reimbursed for it. So um, so we were we did decrease Andrew's budget by a hundred thousand dollars, except with the insurance, we get revenue for some of it. Does that make sense? Yep. So that pretty much stayed the same. We decreased the amount of money we had in staffing and benefits. So at the board meeting last week, the board gave the direction to keep it at four hundred thousand dollars, to not go above it, and we are below that. We are below four hundred thousand dollars right now. It's around two hundred sixty-five thousand, three hundred thousand. It's around three hundred thousand dollars right now for staffing and benefits. Um, and then the board asked us to look at general school budgets and decrease increase the Montpelier, the three Montpelier schools by $10,000. And then when we actually looked at the ratio for the Roxbury budget, we decided to decrease the Roxbury budget by $2,000 um, instead of the 5,000. And so just because of the ratio, the percentage of that cut from their budget. Um, and so they've done that, the, the principals have done those cuts. So we followed the parameters, even though revenue was coming in, we knew what the board was valuing and we decreased those cuts. Um, and kept some the same. Does that make sense? From that direction. Yeah, and we, yeah, we we were able to get it's revenue in. So we've gone from what eight hundred thousand. Yeah, we can't hear you. Can't hear you. Oh, so I said, and we got revenue in. So we, you know, so we were facing eight hundred thousand. So some of the cuts that you know we were able to avoid some cuts. And the other piece, sorry, Scott, before, just so I, yeah. I forgot this piece, the fund balance contribution, the board um, directed us to, to add an additional $200,000 from, so it would be $600,000 total. And we reduced that based on the revenue coming in to one sixty-five, in addition to the 400000 Sorry, Scott, go ahead. Yeah, related to what you were just talking about, maybe I'd Given the parameters that the board sort of gave you at the end of last meeting, um, it seems like the fact that no, nothing was ultimately cut from the facilities, and we we said we'd be fine with up to 100000 being cut from facilities. We also said we'd be fine with up to another 200000 and only 165 is coming additionally from the fund balance. It seems like there's some additional room there to not cut other things that we've already said that we're okay with. 
Um, and then the other, yeah. So I'll just I'll stop there with that that comment because it is related to what you were just talking about. But you want to explain the facilities better, because we did we did cut from facilities. Yeah, we we ended up putting sixty five thousand after Andrew and I reviewed it each time. So we cut essentially sixty five thousand dollars we won't have to use. Like we won't right that we yeah. won't you yeah. don't get insurance payment out right. And okay. then we, we I'm not going to say there won't be an emergency that comes up and we need a new boiler or something, but this, as yeah. far as what we're budgeting, yeah, what we're budgeting. 65, Thank you. <laughs> no, but Scott's point stands that we prioritized buckets and it seems like we didn't reduce by those numbers completely. So some of these more dire cuts, it seems like we left ourselves more wiggle room from when we left last week to today. The only thing I'm going to say about that, I, I agree, but um, we have four more years to go. So as we're taking money out of that fund balance, it's going to be money that won't be there for the next four years. So I don't know that we should just think because we've got, you know, managed to finagle some things, we should just go for it. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. I know it won't, won't be there, but if we're using it to sustain a, or to keep one more year of, something that's going to be a sustained, we're going to have to deal with that expense at some point. Emma. I agree with that sentiment um, that Lynn is saying, but I also feel like I agree with what Jake was saying, that this particular year is so bizarre and we're having to wrap our brain around, you know, the new um, waiting uh, and how much cuts we're going to have to make. And we've consistently kind of wanted to start strategizing about what the five years is going to look like and then have been told and decided that we kind of can't because so many factors, including what the legislature might do to the waiting in the future. So in a way, if we're going to be a little more generous with fund balance, I'd rather do it this year. You know, like I feel like that buys us a little time to be more strategic in the following four years. Um, and to wait to see what happens in with the legislature in the actual Act 127. Especially if I think what the point that Scott's trying to make is I'm seeing $35,000 in savings of, of what we had indicated for facilities and a $35,000 savings from what we had indicated for fund balance, that equals 70, and that more than takes care of the and, and I'm not, I, you know, like these are sort of building level decisions that you need to make, but I, I would feel comfortable with offsetting those 2.2s if that meant retention and that sort of thing. And that was better overall. The ultimate decision I feel like ends up being up to the administration and like what makes sense for the building. Um, but it's something to consider. Yeah. I would just say, the thing, Emma, you didn't mention is we also reduced, or Libby in this draft budget also reduced, the board had directed $400,000 of salary cuts and we're now at 300,000. So there was a reduction of that as well. So if we're talking about where did we find, where did we apply those savings? It was on salaries, fund balance and facilities. The schools are the ones who we are basically saying, sorry, you have to, sorry, principals, you still have to make all of the cuts we've asked you to make. Which even that to me, like the school budgets, I don't know that much about the school budgets, but it's come up in the past around field trips and equity and, you know, uh, graduation and moving on ceremonies. And it did sound quite generous, the numbers that Libby threw out at the last meeting. But I've also been part of conversations where I was surprised at, you know, how little money they had for certain things at the school. So like that was actually a category that I, I wasn't that excited to cut because all the things that Libby listed that were being spent out of that budget directly impacted student experience, which is what we indicated we are not interested in impacting. So, all right. So I wouldn't be interested in continuing to cut thirty five thousand or thirty two thousand every year from our school budgets, for example. Yeah. But maybe that's the thing we have to do this year in this super weird year. And then. You know, this is this is the first of several super weird, weird years. So, uh, yeah, and there are no guarantees that this law is going to change one bit 
in the next five years. And I think with Phil Scott as governor, it drops really close to single digits. Brett, and then I Brett. wanted to add something yeah. too. I, I sort of agree with them. I mean, we went from catastrophic red alert to it's, you know, the, the, the numbers have only been trending in one direction. That's my first just thing that I want to say. I also want to talk about briefly the $100,000 of revenue for the after school program at RBS. I don't want to get too far into the numbers because when I do the math, there's, you know, I don't know exactly what it's going to come out as, but I would guess that you would have to sort of set a tuition and then people would either opt in or opt out. What happens if the tuition scares half of the expected people? Do you eat it? Do we eat it? Or does it get canceled? Or how does the, how would that work? Like there's not like people aren't paying anything now. There's not a great, you know, hunger for tuition for after school program in Roxbury as one might imagine. And so if people don't opt in, what happens? I think we'd have to look at, because we've thought about that, <laughs> and we'd have to look at the number of kids we have and then make a determination of whether it's worthwhile. I think the district would, to use your words, eat a certain factor, um, but if we're servicing three children, then probably not the rest of it. You know, But if we're servicing 15, that's that's half of Roxbury. So that would be something that we'd probably look at to use fund balance money to cover the costs. Can I just add? Yeah. yeah. We looked at what Union Elementary is paying, what their parents are paying, and that's what we we kind of used as a model for Roxbury's program. Does Union have a sort of a, a scholarship model as well, or a, or a, or a way in which some families who can can help some families can't or other ways to come up with part sort of two is a sources of revenue. Part two is a what's it called, Kristen? License program. A license program. So it has their stars and uh and so they can collect subsidy from the state. Roxbury is not not that. Nor has it ever been that. But is there well, I would hope that there would be a, a good discussion in case there are ways to come up with ways. You mean something like a sliding scale? Well, no, 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 more like, you know, I mean, some people might pay more, like, you know, like some sometimes some people pay more because they know it's gonna help somebody else. And if that, if there's a little bit of discussion, um, just to, to feel out whether there was some, some way to sort of work through things there. I don't know how complicated that would be or whether, you know, I know it would be worth the time, your time from the perspective of Roxbury families. I don't know how much time you have. So I'm just kind of putting that up. Yeah. I just wanted to add a piece to the, you know, thinking beyond this year that act the, the new weights that were applied in Act 127 certainly do have an impact but not as significant as I look at slide 30 from the presentation as the drop in the dollar yield from FY24 to FY25. And that is also something that we can anticipate will be dropping a whole heck of a lot. And that does also factor, get then calculated in to for us to figure out um, the tax rate. So anyway, it, um, it's just another thing for us to be considering when we think about not just cuts we're going to have to make this year, but in future years. Jake, um, actually, the the um, because there's so many more pupils in the system, um, that's why the yield dropped so much this year. Um, but from now on, it's going to be normal movement of the yield. Um, it's not going to continue to plummet by six thousand dollars every year. Right, it's that's a one-time thing. That's good because that would last a year and a half. I don't necessarily know that. Sorry, Mia. If the <laughs> education fund, because nobody's talking about how much of the education fund is going to be used by these budgets that are being passed statewide. And if the education fund is lower, the yield needs to follow. Yes, but this massive plummeting. You're right. It might not be as massive. Having 50% right? more kids in the yeah. system. Yeah. Yeah. 
Back with my seven added 50% more kids in the total Vermont system. As far as the math yeah, goes. As far as the Jane, weighted, people weighted, people. weighted pupils, right? Yeah. yeah. That, that. We did not get 50% more students. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I, 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 I wasn't know. sure whether or not it turned out to add sort of revenue overall or whether it just yep. didn't. You know what I mean? Um, well, so at, at least people's towns are seeing some places are seeing a, a, a lot of help and that yeah. I will feel well, I will tell you Brett though that they're not so a lot and this goes beyond our budget and it may not be yeah. the best place to talk about it right now but the superintendents who are from advantage districts the opposite of us are not able to add a lot to their budget for two reasons one the governor's messaging so they're generally in more conservative towns and if the governor says schools are pay or are spending too much money, they believe it. And so they're gonna, they're worried about their, every single one of them are worried about their budgets going down because of governor's me messaging. And then the second thing is because they're worried about the education fund. And so they're worried that if the education fund, if the legislature doesn't do something about the education fund and the dollar yield continues to drop, precipitously or not, and whether this is a, a founded worry or just a worry of superintendents, then they will have a cat. They'll reach a cliff in five years, just like us. Yeah. And another thing is, I understand the education fund is that because of the five percent cap, what the education fund is doing is it's, it's shifting to the advantage districts, but then it's also having to backfill what the taxpayers in the disadvantaged districts are getting covered via the cap. So it's getting, it's getting, you know it's normal expenditure and then it's getting sucked off of by the disadvantaged districts to make up for it, which means it's being spread thinner. Is there any indication that the superintendent association is going to have an opportunity to address the education committee and legislative session? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. We're lobbying. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 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 We are lobbying, lobbying. Yes. Um, the first task is to get everybody who are in important seats to understand the educational finance system fully, which I don't believe is happening. Maybe it'll be a huge boom in sports betting revenue. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Fill that in. Yeah. I heard that on VPR this morning. January <laughs> 11th. Uh, Dang it. Uh, how are we feeling? How are we feeling about public comment? Do we want more board discussion? Are we ready to open it up to the public? I've got a, a, Scott. A quick question or comment. Um, so the equalized residential tax rate, right? That's the that's the thing that we don't want to go over ten percent increase. No. Yeah. You're close. The pew pew purple spend per, per people spend. Yeah. That's what we don't. This one. Per, per, yeah. Six hundred. Per, per people. Compared to this. Yes. That one. Okay. To that one. Last year, ten. And right now, you said we're somewhere around. We're point. covering nine percent increase. Why wouldn't we? make it closer to 0.99. Yeah, we thought we had that originally. Christina and I were at a conference with superintendents and business managers from across the state last Monday. And one of the themes that we heard that honestly, we the two of us hadn't thought about yet was that because a lot of these numbers are predictions and estimates, they could go the opposite. They're going in the right way right now, but they could very well go in a different direction. And so this leaves us some wiggle room so we don't come back to you on January 3rd and say, Oops. Ooh, we got some we got some bad numbers and we have to figure out and we need to make these additional cuts. So staying around 9% gives us a comfort um, for, now. for now. Yeah. yeah. So on March 5th, we're not going to be at 9%. Uh, we're going to be somewhere close to We don't know. We could. Yeah, we don't know. I mean, the thing is, if you're at 0.99%, you give yourself absolutely no margin for error in case something tweaks up. If you're at 9%, then a few things could yes. tweak up and you're still not having to be like, okay, we've, we've got to make cuts from our planet. Well, we have time before we submit the budget to the town to to what? shift that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what we pass on January 7th is what we pass. I mean, some of these 17th, some of these numbers aren't going to be from totally final until... June. June. Yeah. Right. Gotcha. Reps. Uh, I, I was going to suggest a list of things that we pop in, but if we don't know until June, doesn't matter. You can't, you can't play with it. 
I was just thinking like, if you get to a place where we have, you know, 90 95% confidence in the numbers that we have, and there's room for a 0.2 science teacher, can it go in at the last minute? Can there be some things that kind of pop in at the last minute, but not if we won't know for sure until June because the budget's well cooked? Right, so by statute, we have to have the budget presented to voters uh, 30 days before town meeting. So on the warning, all your voters are seeing uh, the ballot language and that's what they're voting on in March. So you can't change anything. I mean, of course you can say we wanna hire this or we need to hire this person or whatever. Within the budget. Make adjustments to the budget. You can't adjust the budget. You can overspend the budget or underspend the budget, but you can't make a change to those numbers because they need to go to the town clerks. Um, so then you can get your tax bill in July. So, but we can, so we, there is, so you could I mean, add things. You could After actually, the budget was done, you could say, actually, we can afford this point to science teacher position or FTE, whatever it is. I mean, you have to find a revenue source for it, which oftentimes is like the reserve fund for a year or, you know, yeah. So and you can't just pass a budget that's for 30 million and be like, okay, we're going to spend 36 million. Let's go, you know, let's go crazy. But like the 0. 0.5 pre K position. Yeah. That has been unfilled because it's not operating. That's been going into the general fund. Is that correct? And budgeted. Unfitted, un, un, budgeted money that's not spent ends up in the general in, fund. Exactly. As, yeah. So if yeah, if we budget for an expenditure and you know, say several staff positions opt out of benefits because they're going with a spouse or partner's benefits. And that saves us a, a bunch of money that we budgeted for, that would go into the reserve funds. Is it too that. much to ask of you? It's other, too much to ask of you guys. The other thing to think about think of your budget is if you are underspending in this area, you might be overspending in facilities because the roof had to get fixed. Yeah. You know? So if, if your kitchen's on fire, you're not going to redecorate your living room. So I, that's how I always think of a budget your house, right? And so um, you might gain some and you lose some, and that's why I provide you report reports so we can see where those changes are happening. Yeah. Thank you. Public comment? Great. Um, so let's do it. Uh, I know we have several people in the room. My guess is at least a few of you want to say something, and uh, we have a healthy number of folks online too. Um, can people in the room just raise their hand if they want to speak? Only three? Is that it? Uh, people on the on virtual, on Zoom. Uh, could you uh, do the raise hand function if you want to speak? And if you don't know where that is, it's, it's uh, down at the bottom of your bar, I think under reactions. Uh, Either raise your hand or just wait. I've seen zero online. Is that <laughs> the actual case? Okay. Um, three people. Uh, try to keep it to a minute or two. I'm not going to keep time. Um, but if you could try to keep it to a you know short, but not does have to be terribly short. That would be fantastic. Uh, and again, if anyone online changes their mind, just go ahead and raise the hand function. And when the room changes their mind, you can obviously step up. Uh, so whoever wants to go first, uh, please do. Hi, I'm Morgan Lloyd. I teach fourth grade at Union Elementary School, and I live in Montpelier. I have kids at the high school, two in the high school, um, and I pay taxes here. Um, I have two. I have a quick question, and then um, a, a comment to share. My question is whether increasing the number of students who pay tuition to attend school in the district is a viable way to influence the budget, either by increasing enrollment or increasing revenue. It it is most definitely. 
a viable way to increase revenue. And one of the places we're looking at it is to get more exchange students, international exchange students who pay tuition. So there's two different kinds of international students. So it depends on the visa they're on. Um, so we want to get the ones that pay tuition. <laughs> My thoughts exactly. And so um, my other comment is for the board, um, as we looked at, um, on for me, I forget what page it's on, looking um, at future reductions at Union Elementary School uh, because of low class size. There was a slide that showed that per pupil spending is up at Union, um, maybe drastically because of smaller class sizes. And I just want to ask the board to consider um, the really essential foundational skills in literacy and math and social emotional learning, like how to get along in this world with other humans that kids are gaining in those early years. And I really feel like class size does significantly impact a teacher's ability to uh, give individual attention to students, to respond to students as individuals and not just as a, a class that needs to be managed to meet with small groups to work on those foundational skills. Um, I don't know if I'm old enough to say, or if I've been doing this a long, long enough to see a trend, but um, in the roughly 17 years that I've been teaching, I don't see the social emotional needs or, uh, let me just put it this way. I see needs only increasing over the years. Um, and I think that post pandemic and post flood and in our current economy where many people are not as well off as they might like to be and maybe there are health or mental health issues that are sort of community wide. I think that we can probably anticipate that kids are gonna continue to struggle um, and need those supports. And I think our, our schools are doing a fantastic job right now meeting those needs with multi-tiered systems of support and social, um, social workers and social emotional work learning staff. Um, but I feel nervous when I see those uh, petitions targeted for reductions in the future. I don't need class sizes to be like 12 to 15, but there's a big difference between 16 and 20, and then another big difference between 20 and 23 or 24. Okay. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, Morgan. Morgan. Yeah, and, and I do want to say one thing that we are not considering, which I know other districts in our position are considering changing our class size policy. I mean, I think the uh, the numbers we're looking at, yeah, the numbers we're looking at UES is probably a discussion we would be having even if we weren't in in the budget situation we are just because they're, you know, they're the classes are, are getting, they're at the, so they're projected to be at, at the very low end of what our policy suggests and um, kind of well below kind of the optimal. We're not, we're not at a stop the classroom mode at all. Um, yeah, Joe. Good evening. Uh, Libby, me, and Jim, thank you again for coming to the MREA board meeting yesterday. We really appreciate oh, that. Um, we appreciate you leaning into the questions we had and striving to create a sense of understanding around these constraints. So thank you again. So I know it's year one of a five-year process, and my hope is that we can continue to ponder, I guess, how to create the conditions or sustain the conditions for transparency around how and why future personnel cuts may or may not happen. And I think the meeting yesterday was a good start to that. I just want to underscore that. I also want to say that even though we're striving to have cuts, you know, in a way that has the least impact on human beings, and I honor that that's the intent, the way our system works is kind of wonky, and it's based on seniority. And I know that's been said by a few folks on the board here tonight, but in reality, a rip in one place doesn't really have the, even though the intent is there, it doesn't really have the impact, I think, that you're suggesting it does. And what I mean by that is that one rift in one area will lead to adverse effects for a human being. And just as a teacher, I think that an entire ecosystem uh, can kind of go away when that happens, right? So you have a teacher and dozens or over a hundred students, and that has a significant impact, I think, on the learning experience. And just to kind of echo what you said earlier in the kind of lifeline that teachers can support. So I would just ask you to consider that even though reasonable people could disagree on say a point two sustainability position, and I don't wanna litigate that here tonight, um, the impact of that is significant and it does affect a, a human being who will have to consider other options outside of our district. And I think the last thing I'll say, I'll try to go quick here because it's probably over time. 
Um, and Morgan said this already more eloquently than I could, but students are coming to us with a variety of needs that are stretching teachers beyond capacity. And I'm hoping you can continue to think about that when you're talking about cuts. And I think that like it or not, we're in a moment where it's not just the exceptional content instructional delivery. And that's already been said. Thank you for acknowledging that. It's not just literacy or numeracy or any other knowledge domains that we're valuing as a district. It's a sense of belonging, meaning safety, community. And I think for students to know in their heart that in a world that's becoming more volatile, accelerating, uncertain, and changing, that the teachers are preparing them for that in a way that they feel they can influence that world and have an impact for the better. And I think that takes a whole lot of support and guidance. In other words, maybe more personnel, not less. And so I just invite everybody to be thinking about that as we move forward for the next few budget cycles. Thank you. Great advice. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Twice, I know, sorry. <laughs> you Micah, very popular. Um, still supporting the track, but just um, more on the what Morgan had said. I was like, well, do we increase numbers? Do we increase revenue? You know, is there almost like, do we need 20 more students and then whatever that equivalent is or what, what's that number? Do we have a target so we can maybe keep the staff that we want and the budget that we want and be the school we want to be and then see if we can partner with the city on that and be part of the greater housing crisis discussion because I think that's a really big part of it. I have so many friends who would love to live in Montpelier, but they can't. So then they're in the U32 right. district, they're in the Barry district. If we could find a way so um, if we could be part of that larger discussion and stop our trend going down and get it to level or maybe even go up a little bit, maybe that could help so that years, the, the four more years that we're you know, worried about, rightfully, maybe we can find a way to have that be not so bad. So um, love for us to try to crack that down. Thanks. Yeah, no, thank you. Thanks, yeah, and, and thanks for noting that a lot of the trends we're seeing are trends beyond our control and you know including you know obviously housing has a lot to do with it you know the city just went through a flood you know the the city's going to be asking a lot of our taxpayers as well um i don't know who's moving to the u32 district because their numbers are plummeting as well um more so, than ours. more so than ours by a considerable amount i mean like rumney's projected numbers i think for a year or two are rumney and Doty's are Romney's projected numbers for like this year or for like the next couple of years is something um, like two thirds of what it was. Uh, yeah, so it's, yeah. We are not in that position. We are not in that position, so. Um, but I, I also will say that I've thought a lot about the flood throws a curveball, yeah. right? So I don't know what our enrollment's gonna do. Are people gonna see Montpelier as an opportunity and and when some leave come, some come in as an opportunity for a, a different start with a new business where there's plenty of space for businesses right now, right? Um, are our people going to leave because of the flood and because of maybe a lack of opportunity or because of the cost of living or the lack of housing? I just, I don't know what that's going to be. Yeah. We're not in a, just like we're in a wacky budget year, like Jake said, there's, it's very hard to make a prediction about the city the town in the future in the next five years and how that will yeah. influence us. I yeah. Don't know. Yeah, no. And we also, I mean, I'm very cognizant of not getting into a rolling situation where, you know, we want to bring more families to Montpelier with kids who can enter our system. If the story about Montpelier is that our tax rates are going like this and our school budgets are going like this, you know, pay more, get less is not a come move to Montpelier story. Uh, and, and we want to do all we can to avoid that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, I wasn't trying not speaking, but I don't want to regret not speaking. Um, so I'm Allison Waring. I'm a science teacher at MHS. I'm also a Montpelier resident. I own a house here. Um, I just want you to think about how much money you may or may not 
85 that you point to from the science department. Um, it's a little bit of, as Joe said, a wonky situation where I'm low man on totem pole. I make less per FTE than everybody else in the science department. So um, if you cut 0.2 for my position, you're left with 0.4 that could be covered by other people in the science department, but they, based on their seniority, make more than me per FTE. So it potentially could be that you actually end up spending more money in the science department by cutting 0.2 from my position. Uh, so I'm not, I would ask you to think about if the board doesn't think a district sustainability position is valid, a valid expense, um, what could we do with that funding to benefit students? Are there more creative classes that we could offer in the science department um, that would increase student engagement? Um, I've taught a course that has been grant funded for two years here. So I've been paid by a grant instead of the school district um, that the school district hasn't wanted to pick up as a paying position. It's the river class, all about rivers, very pertinent to Montpelier students. Or um, it's been talked about lots that our science classes aren't accessible to a certain population of our students. There are students that need modified curriculum that um, we can't really provide within general education classroom. Is there a way that we could provide an introductory science class to those students that need something different than what we're offering? right now because those students are basically being passed through the system, right? So I would ask you to think about if we don't need a district sustainability person, what might we need that could help our our students? Thank you. Thanks for the question. Allison, sorry. Mm -hmm. Nathan. Um, my name is Nathan Suter. I live in Montpelier. I have two kids in the district. Um, it's very hard to follow Allison. Uh, that's that's where it's on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, as always, to the board for being so thoughtful and for Libby and your team for being so thoughtful as you go through this. Uh, I just a, a few detailed questions. When we talk about taxes, property taxes in our city that are driven by education spending. And we know that 66% of the of our households are income sensitized. I was realizing that I shouldn't assume that that just means their property taxes, I say there because I'm not income sensitized, um, that their property taxes stay flat no matter what we do, right? So I would love Jake <laughs> or somebody who understands the tax structure, love to understand sort of, I'm assuming that you know those numbers change in different ways, but it'd be nice to have even more precision on that. I don't know if that, anyway, um, because I think when we have conversations in our community and we say, we want to invest in education, here's the impact on you. It's good to know what exactly we need. Um, and I, uh, I get concerned the same way that you do when I see enrollment declining. And I think about, you know, what's the, what's the one biggest thing we can do to uh, stabilize and increase enrollment, and I think it is to be excellent. And you all have done so much work to make the this district excellent. It's it's um, just they're very thoughtfully constructed uh, in terms of staffing strategies, using data uh, to meet the needs of kids, thinking about social emotional learning, uh, feelings of belonging, and I think that that is you know. Uh, that is a real differentiator potentially of this community in this district from many others. And I think if we, uh, you know, I wouldn't do it quite as dramatically as Jim did, but if we if we start to sort of fall off of that, we lose our you know competitive edge. When if I'm if I'm a family trying to move to Vermont or just within Vermont, uh, and I care about my kids and education, I want to be part of this district. And so I want us to think through that lens with a long term view. Uh, so that's that's the big heavy stuff. I also happen to coach middle school track and field here in this district. 
uh, which I also love and care deeply about, and I know that you are about to discuss whether or not to uncommit the committed fund balance that have been dedicated towards renovating the track. Uh, and I think that um, I think there are there is a reasonable position to fall back to, given all the other things that we as a district are facing. Um, I talk about this facility as a neglected facility because it's been, you know, we had a we had a, a state championship high school track program for decades, as I understand it, back in the day before my time. Then it evaporated and the, the track fell into disrepair. We gave away our sold equipment. And so now we have uh, a track that survived the flood remarkably well. So it's a resilient, it's a resilient facility already. Uh, but we don't have any equipment and the curb that defines inside the track uh, was was viable enough two years ago that I could mark it, you know, from where the starts and the staggers and things like that are and reliably come back the next year and not have to measure that again with a wheel. That curb is gone or almost entirely gone. So there are some, uh, I've, you know, made the, the analogy before, if, if our auditorium were in that condition, we would maintain it. And I just want us to maintain the facility that we've got. So let's bring it back up, if possible, to safe, working, reliable condition that doesn't take hundreds of hours of parent volunteer time to make it viable for competition. Um, and let's equip that facility and that team, those teams, with you know a discus cage that protects people from getting hit by a discus, hurdles, uh, a pole, pole vault equipment, and just sitting here this evening. Um, Equipment wise, that looks like that's about forty five thousand uh, dollars, and then, you know, replacing the curb on the inside of the track, taking care of the condition of the track, um, making sure that weeds aren't growing there constantly, etc. Those are some you know, facilities, installation things that might that, that might be more expensive, and, and I can try to meet with Andrew about that. But I think as a fallback position from committing one point nine million dollars, okay. If we acknowledge that, that that we're not going to get, you know, we couldn't find a contractor to build a new track for that price on the timeline that we wanted. Okay, so if that's not going to happen, what can we do that is, and this is not operating costs, right? This is not me wishing to take funds from Allison's position. This is an investment in a facility that will last for decades if if we need for it. And so uh, I think if we can if we can do that, then we are in one other my, modest way, being excellent for our community and our students. Um, I had a, a parent of a, an athlete write me back the email saying that that was a track athlete. I uh, thought, well, as long as we have access to U32, I'm not sure we really need to care for our track. And my disagreement with that uh, idea is that when we have 70 to 80 middle school track athletes who want to train every day, uh, if I, they can, they can get from the middle school to the high school by walking safely on sidewalks in 20 minutes and be prepared for practice at a facility that is not well equipped right now. As soon as I place practice at U32 to use what is no doubt an excellent facility, I lose as many as half or more of those students because of transportation issues. And so in terms of, you know, I love track and field because it's accessible, it's uh, anybody anyone can participate and increase their performance and experience success and build community. And so by taking care of what's already ours, we can keep that an accessible, low barrier uh, athletic building. So I realize that the main show tonight is about the overall school budget of $32 million, which we absolutely should invest in our students. Uh, just a bid for let's preserve some space for our facilities that we Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Nathan. Anyone else in the room? Let's see, we have at least one person on the screen. There's a hand on the. Oh, yeah, I see one person who wants to speak. Anyone else online? Anyone else in the room? Looks like two online, Jim. Where's the second one? Oh, oh, okay. Physically. 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 Um, yeah, let's start with the person with the with the actual like Craig Bauer. Craig Bauer, and then um, I'm not seeing a name under the person who's waving, but we see you, Craig. 
And you thank you. Yourself, even though we just said your name about three twice. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, Jim. Um, my name is Craig Bauer. I have four students in the district. Um, <clears throat> I have four kids. They're all students in the district. Um, uh, three of them go to Roxbury Elementary. Um, we moved here specifically for a small school setting um, and for our kids to thrive in that small school setting. So to hear you all talk about um, not changing the size of classrooms, I applaud you for that um, at the other schools. So thank you um, for bringing that up. Um, the thing that concerns my, myself and, and my wife as well, um, I, I don't hear us talking more about math, reading, writing. Um, I hear the social emotional stuff. Yes, I, and, I, and I understand that, but it does seem like that is highly weighted um, compared to math, history. Um, these are things that, that, you know, my family values and that we value. Um, and I know our, our Roxbury community for sure um, values. And, and there are very few of us that can speak, um, that can, can, can talk to these sorts of things. And, you know, I know um, there was a, a, a member of our community that spoke at one of the board meetings uh, last time, and she was very emotional about it. And, and, you know, I just had to reach out to her and say, you know, it does, it, it's, it's okay to feel the way we're feeling when we're feeling so um, secluded in, in a lot of ways. And I know our students are feeling that way too um, when they do integrate into the Montpelier area. Um, Rhett, Kristen, thank you guys for everything that you do. Rhett, I have heard you um, speak of the weight that you hold. Um, I want you to understand you do not have to hold that weight. Um, I know, we all know how much you care. Um, and I just really appreciate you very much, my friend. Um, I, I, I love this community so much. I, 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 I love the school system. Um, I don't appreciate necessarily, though, what we're valuing right now um, as a school system or, or how we're, you know, talking about a track situation when we're talking about our kids. I, I, I. I'm, I'm looking at a high schooler on the screen right now who's a part of this board meeting who that's who we should be really focused on um, in general are just these kids and setting them up for success. Does a track situation do that? Sure, I understand that, but we're not the Midwest. Um, athletics bring money into the schools in the Midwest. It, it does not here. Um, we just have to face that fact. And I know I'm over my time, but I do feel like I needed to say something along the lines of math, writing, reading, um, history. Those, those mean a lot to me um, and my family. Um, thank you guys though, I appreciate it. No, thank you, appreciate it as well. Um, and then, yes, um, I, Nancy, Nancy Bruce, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Thank you, board members, for the extraordinary work that's before you. Um, you know, it's like the ultimate Rubik's Cube of like, how do we pull this all together? And I really deeply appreciate all your time and energy doing this for our students and our families here in Montpelier. Um, and I just, I would like to comment on a couple of things that, um, In terms of enrollment, getting families in, I don't know how that's going to happen when it, uh, the people that are here can barely afford to even stay here, um, being uh, middle class <clears throat> and lower middle, middle class. So there's no housing. So I don't, I'm not sure where the you know, the logic of increasing enrollment for foreign students. I'd love to get more information about that. And I really appreciate what um, Morgan said about class size and the needs of the students. I'm a former public school teacher and I totally get it. Like 
the 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 need the pressure on our families is gigantic and the issues are huge and i don't in any way want to compromise as our previous um spokesperson said about the the elemental pieces of academic learning i don't think i i guess what i would like to hear from you is looking at i'm sorry the track survived the flood maybe it'll survive another 50 years and I, I i understand that there's there's so much that we want for our children but there's only there's like not enough money to cover all these ideas and for me i want to come back to academics and the most important essential things and i i asked the board to i i haven't heard much about, and I try to be in all the meetings and distracted by kids here, but um, I hear about cutting costs of teachers, but I haven't heard about the all the extracurricular activities, um, sports, those salaries, those benefits, of those amazing, wonderful people that we love and appreciate, what what piece does that have to add to our equation as we try to figure this out? And I apologize if you already talked about that, um, but that's all I have to say. And again, thank you. You guys are amazing thank you for serving this community and all that you're doing with your time no thank you nancy really appreciate it anyone else online those can return no okay great thank you everyone for um a very thoughtful comment The agenda. Yeah. I think the next thing is the track. That's what I thought too. Uh, the yeah. Track. Uh, so next, um, did you, so what guidance do you need out of the budget? Got some. Should we get you I was asking her what guidance she needed on the budget. We will bring back the second draft next week, taking into new numbers and any feedback that feedback we heard? We don't, so no, we don't need any more guidance. Okay. <laughs> um, um, that finally got my thing to show up. Uh, so next is a discussion as, um, as come up before. Uh, potential action regarding uh, the assigned funds. As you know, we assigned $1.9 million for the track. Um, I suggested in the last meeting, and Miriam actually suggested before I did at a previous meeting, that, that just given the uncertainty over the next few years and how we might want to use those funds, that the current assignment is not, I think, really an accurate intention of the board's thoughts. I do want to say, I think everyone on the board who voted for the track still supports the idea of a track. We're just in a different financial situation with different uncertainties. Um, if we do vote to unassign the track, that does not mean that we will never build the track. It does not mean that we will not do at some point the type of upgrades that uh, have been suggested. Uh, obviously, we want a safe facility, um, but I think right now, as we envisioned that when we passed it is not how we're envisioning the use of those funds. If, if For no other reason that we don't have a clear vision of the use of those funds, and I think having to be assigned to the track is something that keeps coming up. It is not necessarily helpful for the framing of 
how those funds are currently being viewed by the board. Um, and another thing we have going on that I think will inform just p potential expenditures with those funds uh, around our grounds in general is we have a facilities report. I mean, the budget has kind of eclipsed the concerns that we had a few months ago about the flooding, but we are going to get a report on our facilities, including suggestions about um, how these grounds should best be used going forward. And I think that's also going to inform what we might want to do with those, those funds. So I suggested at the last meeting just unencumbering those funds uh, so they don't have a designation, so people aren't confused. Again, that doesn't mean that we're retreating from any ideas long term. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're reassigning those funds any place. We're just right now, as we envision those funds being used for a track, that track project is probably not something that we would not need to totally revisit and rediscuss before we move forward again. And I think unassigning the 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 funds uh, reflects more, I think, where we're at with it, which is we want to we want these funds available to uh, help guide the district through the next five years as adeptly as possible. Uh, and again, that could mean some sort of track modification. Uh, if we get great news from the legislature and some other things change, it could mean that we could revisit that project and reassign to that project. So that's my proposal. And I'd love to hear any any thoughts. Um, Jill. I was just wondering if we knew what our overall athletics or athletics and extracurricular activities budget is. And the reason I'm asking is I I the things that folks have suggested as ways to like at least literally use the track safely seem pretty reasonable. I And then I think it's really unfortunate that because we had this great momentum about the track, that it has become kind of a punching bag for a lot of things. But having the curb fixed and the hurdles replaced and a safety net for shot foot, javelin, discus, seem like they would be part of an athletics budget and shouldn't even, again, continue to be kind of a punching bag and lightning rod in public meetings when there's lots of other athletics and my kids, one of the mass kids, like there's lots of things we do. And I just think I would really like to support something from our athletics budget to at least provide the minimum, because I, I don't, I don't agree with the um, characterization that it's track versus students it's very much track is students. And it's actually a huge number of our students. Yes. And it's probably one of the least expensive and most inclusive outdoor athletic opportunities that kids have. So I fundamentally disagree that it's it's not a student a specific investment to invest in the track. I completely agree and understand we're in a different financial spot. So I, I, I definitely think we do need to reassign the 1.9 million. And I think it seems very reasonable to have some of our athletics budget, which pays for uniforms and busing and all these other things, could do the minimum piece for something that's used by so many kids. So whatever those that yeah. laundry list is to make it safe seems very reasonable and and modest yeah. as part of. And also other athletic teams use that area as well. Um, and I've also heard, yeah, a track is actually a pretty great use of a floodplain. It's like a parking lot. It's not great, but it works in a flood. So I I just, I'm really sorry that the track has become this, this public lightning rod when it really, I don't think it's necessary. And it's, it's ignoring a whole other piece of the experience that students have here. That's not getting that same level of scrutiny. Jill, you can see on slide 21 of the budget yeah. presentation, co-curriculars athletics, you can see the past yeah. two years and the proposed number which yeah. slide, sorry. And, and before i end i want i want to build on that i mean the idea that extracurriculars is a distraction from our students is one of the most absurd concepts out there i mean think about your own high school experience yes academics were super important but some of your biggest growth experiences some of your biggest formations of identity some of your biggest life learning experiences some of your biggest friendship building experiences some of your biggest confidence building experiences oftentimes came from extracurricular activities, the play you were in, the sport you you were in, that you grew and, and you you pushed yourself. And 
and, and you learned how teamwork works and all of those life lessons. If, if you're, you know, I, I have very little patience for people who thinks extracurriculars is distracting from students. It can be some of the most meaningful experiences our kids have. And I, and it's a very small portion of our budget. Uh, and um, it would be an absolute shame if, if we robbed kids of some of these really life-changing opportunities and life-building opportunities. Well, Jim, to add on that, at MHS and MSMS here, we don't call them extracurriculars because yeah. they're not extra, they're co-curriculars. Mm -hmm. They are part of our program and part of what yeah. we offer students. And yes. as the superintendent, I would never support a place that did not include that. It's just, it's just not something that's even feasible in my mind. And not only are they very inexpensive, but they're they're supported by, I mean, and this brings the, the whole community in and kids learn from the community members. You know, so many of the coaches, so many of, of the, the people who, who make the plays possible, uh, who make our music productions possible, are basically volunteer community members who give hours and hours and hours for, you know, like a $1,200 stipend or something. It's it it is such a valuable experience for the community well, and for the students. Or a teacher, or they're a teacher who's giving time. Great way for us yeah. to interact with the teacher outside of the classroom. Absolutely, Jake and then Scott. I was just going to say that um, if kids are going to be using it, I definitely want it to be safe and adequate. Um, and ask, um, have we ever, have we recently um, gotten an estimate on how much it would cost to bring it up to? To usability. No. Andrew, could give you. You said you expected maybe Or whatever term you want to use well, to bring it that's up. That's the definition. That, that's the that's the question. What is that? What is that level? Um, you know, it's it's been used the way it is for however many years since twenty years ago they started allowing trucks to drive on it, which I think. Exposing earlier, that that was really So that's not an it's not an answer I can give you right here. It's not. It's a conversation of where where do we bring it? What are our priorities? Some of the ideas that have been brought up are great. Where do we store it? So it's, so it's not just the hurdles. It's the rack for the hurdles. It's the machine for all the hurdles. It's the storage to put the hurdles in. Kind of thing. So it's not an easy. Here's the number. There's certain. Incremental improvements with that. Yes. But would that be like facility subcommittee who might have that conversation about the work that we would want to do? It, it could very well be. Um, Jim and I are meeting next Friday to talk about this very thing. I think that the board could make a decision around, you know, if you're thinking about the fund balance money, you could say reserve. $350,000 for track improvements and maintenance. Um, Andrew is correct. We can't store hurdles in the basement anymore. So uh, where are we going to put it? Like that's a that's a big conversation for the board to consider. And in the beginning of the process of the track, we had in there a storage unit, um, which was largely poo-pooed by the community because it was, it was seen as superfluous. Um, so there... That is a reality, like Andrew's not just speaking, that is a reality. So um, if we want to do those kind of equipment and upgrades, we need to find also a storage place for those that equipment that we currently do not have. Um, I think the, the safety questions, I think that's actually the thing that we need the actual number on. What do we need to do to make that surface safe yeah. um, for our athletes and our community members who use it every single day? Um, so that's a... That's a different question that we don't have an answer to right now. And I, I don't even know what an estimate would be because I'm not a track athlete myself. And so I'd have to talk to some experts and Andrew would have to talk to some experts to find out what exactly we're talking about there. Andrew, did your hand shoot up? Yeah, I mean, and I would say it needs to be in the context of the athletics in general because there are 300 people, 400 people watching a basketball game that might say, hey, the scoreboards that the bolts go out every year that we don't really know what the score is because with the scoreboards are 30 years old. <laughs> probably want to weigh in on where athletic comes with these. That's just my guess. Scott, did you want to get in? <laughs> um, 
So, yeah, five percent of the overall five uh, percent of what is spent on curricular is what's spent on co-curricular. So it's a a drop in the bucket compared to um, what general education is, and it is as Jim so eloquently um, shared, like what so many people value from their high school experience and what colleges value uh, when recruiting. Um, so yeah. Um, it, it's uh, not not wise to to think of cutting uh, co-curriculars um, when looking at our overall budget. Um, I I have a question, and I wasn't around for the for the encumbrance of the track money from the fund balance, but why why would that project not be part of the capital plan? I guess is my question, and then I. I think I'm just going to make a motion to unencumber the funds that were set aside for uh, the track project. Yeah, and I can you hold that though. I have some questions too. You can go into discussion. Yeah, Somebody can. Second. You can second it and go into discussion. Sorry, I was speaking out of turn. Um, I'll second it just to get the issue on the table and then we can do discussion. Okay. Uh, discussion. Should we answer Scott's questions? Sure. <laughs> was it the only the one about like why wouldn't it go? Yeah, to but I, was that your only question? My yeah, the main question that I had was how did the track project ever be taken out of the capital plan in the first place? It was never the part of the capital plan. Yeah. Um. So what happened? What two years ago, Jim? Three years ago? We we recognized that we had a very large fund balance and we had ESSER funding coming in that could pay for some other renovation work that we were thinking about using the fund balance for. Um, and because of the fund balance and its largeness, <laughs> um, we started thinking about larger one-time projects that we could spend down some of that fund balance around. Um, and a tr and quite honestly, I came to Jim and said, I, I think the track is the place to, to do it because that's the place that needs the most um, yeah. work at the high school level facility. Um, and that's where the discussion started because we had such a large fund balance and, and needed to start spending that down. Well, um, there is a board meeting I can find for you that, that talks about how the fund balance became so large because it was before your time on the board if you're interested in that. I don't have the part, date on the top of my head. No, that part is not as important for me at this point, I guess, the question is, why, why wouldn't we consider the track project alongside any other capital projects for the district? I think that's what the board has been doing, except not, yeah. just, not through the capital fund. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's... Yeah, I mean the the capital fund is kind of more of a, a maintenance fund. You know those those projects that are significant but not huge. Um, yeah, you know, this is this is a larger project. This is like the renovation of the auditorium that we did a while back. This is more like on the scale of like the UES playground. It's you know it's 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 a major project that needs uh, more than the two hundred fifty thousand dollars that that we ask out of the capital fund. So yeah, one other important detail there is that. The conversation did get sparked by further back by students who actually put together a presentation as part of a class um, to advocate that the board make more investment in the track facility to support the growing number of students participating in track and field. So it was a really beautiful example of how co-curriculars work with our curriculars. And I would I would say that if and when it gets to a place where it's really just about maintaining it, then yeah, it makes sense that it would be part of a capital plan. But given that we knew that the price tag was going to be so significant to, if if what we wanted to do was what we had voted to do about a year ago at this point, um, it's, it's like Jim said, more than the quarter of a million that we essentially spend out of capital fund every year. Yeah. Um, I nice and loud, man. Nice and loud. loud. At the risk of being overly repetitive, I want to add to what everyone's saying and just add my own experience to the importance of the track. I mean, I've been doing track since I was in fifth grade with Nathan when we had like 10 people 
And I think I was one of the youngest ones there and it was a great time. And I have some really weird memories of that, but it was a good time. Um, and since then running has become a really big part of my life. I've made some of my most uh, and most meaningful, most important and most meaningful connections through running, through my sports. Um, struggling with my mental health, with the immense stress of being a high schooler. Um, running is something that's always helped me cope with that. And I know that the same thing is true for the other people who run. And I know that that's not a small number of people, especially compared to the small size of these schools. Um, and also, I, I've done a lot of workouts on that track in the past year. And it's not... Just like anecdotally, it's disappointing and it's kind of embarrassing. Like when I talk to people from other schools, our track is sort of a joke at this point and it shouldn't be all around. We have very good athletics. Our track team is pretty good. That track is just sad. Problem. <laughs> I don't know what to say. It's like, I mean, Spalding's got a dirt track. Their track isn't an embarrassment because at least they've got like pole ball. I, I don't know. Um, so I I can't make a motion because I'm a non-voting member and I really, really don't understand how the rules board or work anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, you got it. That's it. Yeah. You're not um, voting. But I do want to request that either tonight either we do this tonight or we put this on the agenda for some time soon in the future, that we allocate some amount of money to make that, tra make that track functional and safe and a bit less sad. Um, it's really important to a lot of people. Glenn. Thank you. Um, so I have a couple questions. I believe that our kids, we can't have any track meets here. So every time we would normally would have yeah. a home game, we have to go somewhere else. Is that correct? We we basically have to we use 32. Yeah, like at the last, I mean, they think that's better, but the last track meet we hosted last year was at U32. And and I also like, you know, just build on your point about, you know, can we just use U U32 built this track so you 32 could use it. I mean, like they're being very generous. They've, they've been extremely generous with us in terms of giving it time, but also, I mean, not does it influence transportation. It also influences the time. You know, it, it oftentimes will you know to the extent that people have to practice on that track. It's oftentimes after the U32 is practiced so that it becomes a very late practice that gets into dinner time that, you know, makes it harder for families. And, and I'll let Nathan speak. The practice. Uh, that is the, Inevitable mystery. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we, so had, we, ask, we ask parents to to leave work with hopefully a minivan and pick up yeah. the middle school, load them in, transport them to either two, and then a different group of parents would come pick them up and get them. And you hopefully home. have clean driving records and are okay. swear we're right. safe. Yeah. Yeah. But it just, um, Lynn, we have held competitions at our track, and we we I chose not to do that last year. When we do that, I kid you not, it's about a day and a half of probably 10 or 12 parents, a bunch of the middle school and high school team. We literally pull leaves along the curb. We rake uh, leaf litter off the track because it's not well maintained. We use the, uh, the measuring wheel and we walk. I walk the track backwards uh, five times you know, one time per lane to figure out where the start for the 200 meters should be for the second lane and for the third lane. And then we have teams of kids with a string and the, uh, the, the tool that sprays paint to mark lines. Um, we, have a, we have water sprayers because the paint sticks better when the track is damp. Uh, I drive my minivan to Spalding and after making a connection with the Spalding coach, I borrow the other Spalding coach's trailer we load all the Spalding High School hurdles on the trailer, drive it to our track, set up the hurdles, thank them profusely, then do that thing in reverse. Um, Tom Allen, who's a tremendous staff person, 
takes the MRPS trailer down to Northfield and borrows their high jump. This used to be the case. We now have a high jump pit. Borrows their high jump pits, brings those up here for a competition. So you, you're starting to get an idea of the, the sort of lift it took to host a home meet. Um, and we did that twice, twice a season for at least two years. And last year, I you know we do have a good relationship with you too. And so I said, okay, that's it's just it's so much you know so we asked you 32 if we could close there but then we're negotiating with them we're on schedule they're concerned about liability you know who, their staff a bunch of their staff have to be present because it's not our facility um and i love you know, i love collaboration and i think that they're I'm, the answer is the answer is yes and it's just a question of how can we do it but there's a there's a there's a stamina there's a fatigue factor with how often can we do that? And how often can we go to that well with our parents? Um, I would love it if those parents use that same street floor in other ways to support our program. And do we compensate U32 for use of the traffic? I do not believe that we pay to no. use the facility. And don't we pay for bus? Uh, when we have a bus. Yeah, that's right. So you know, if we didn't hold two meets last year and the year before, our competition season in outdoor track and field for middle school would have been, it's not like there were some other meets we could have gone to on those times, right? So the kids, that's like a 30% loss of their competition for the year if we don't do that. And, and we the service we provide to other teams in this region of the state is tremendous because they either don't have facilities or they don't have the, the, the core of volunteers to put on the meet that's well run um, and it's Thank you. I, I still have a question. Oh, sorry. Um, Should I sit here? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think anyone can answer these. Um, one of them is about our budget, though, and that is um, what is there enough included in the line item for um, extracurricular and athletics to um, do improvements to the track this year? No. Is that something that No, you that is budgeted money. So, no, that is not inclusive of any improvements to the track. What the board could do is unencumber the funds today, put it back in our savings account. That's essentially what you'd be doing, right? Is putting it in our savings account. Andrew and I can work with our track coaches and aficionados to find to just to define safety and what needs to happen for that track and get an amount for it, and then come back to the board and say, we need this amount for the work on the track or for equipment or storage shed or whatever. Um, we could come, we could do that over the next, the course of the, you know, budget. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, um, the issue of the floodplain, um, and how much we in, invest in that. I mean, I want, I would like to do improvements to the track, like, um, and at the same time, I'm thinking, okay, you know, how much, what are we thinking of doing because it may get flooded again? And if we think about a storage building, where would that go? Because our property is in a slightly, right? If we wanted to store. So those would be all conversations that we'd be having. Um, our property isn't all in the floodplain. So some of it, a lot of it is, but it's not all there. Um, and as been pointing out, the think about the, the parts of our facility that survived the flood and was under a considerable amount of water the track, the field, or the field in the center of it, our parking lot, um, all of these things survived pretty well. We make better improvements to the track. It's going to it's gonna survive. Um, if we actually did the track, it would survive better, <laughs> quite honestly, um, with the water coming off of it, because that's how that particular area is designed. It's designed for water to fall off of it. It has pathways around it for the water to go to receive quickly. Um, that that's how that air. That's why that field looks so beautiful, and the field didn't have any significant damage to it. Whereas the softball field over here did, because it's not designed that way, right? It was like a clay bathtub. This is not. This is this is designed in a specific way so that so it can be resilient to weather. That's all. Emma. Um, I just want to elevate what Miriam is asking for, and um, uh, and and I 
I hope that we can try to make something like that happen tonight, actually, and maybe alter the motion to unencumber. I mean, I know it's arbitrary, but right now, even the amount that's designated for the track is fairly arbitrary based on the numbers that we got back from the proposals. So maybe like unencumber 1.5 million and keep 400,000, get some better numbers and figure it out. But I would like to so sort of signal the commitment that we made. Um, you know, I've been on the board for three and a half years and I can count on one hand the number of times that we've had students come to us and ask us for something. And they've come to us over and over and over again, just sort of echoing, you know, their desire to have this facility improved. And it's really upsetting. And we're we're in a we're in just upsetting budgetary times. Like that's just all there is to it. There's not a lot of good news happening right now. Um, but it's really upsetting to like not be able to give them the track that we hoped to give them. But I think that I would like to signal to them that we are committed to giving them at least a facility that feels safe, that they're not going to fall off the edge of, that, you know, has all of the equipment that they need to do the different events. Um, so I would I would like to urge other board members to potentially amend the motion. But I think the procedural way in my Robert's rules were never great in the first place. I think Scott, I think we have one of two courses for that. Scott can either amend his motion or we can vote on Scott's motion, yeah. vote it down, and then have someone remotion. Yeah, or, or, or Scott can withdraw his motion. The motion to encumber $400,000. Or unencumber one point five. Does it so doesn't matter? matter. I, I don't think it, it matters. It just needs a motion. It just needs, okay. We have a motion on the table is the point. Okay, so why don't we why do we do that? Why don't we vote on Scott's motion and then reassign four hundred thousand dollars? I just heard a withdrawal. Scott can't withdraw. Oh, he can't. You want to withdraw your? You can want to withdraw. Okay. He also had his hand up earlier. Jake, sorry. This is sort of predates Scott's motion, but like, why are we doing anything right now on the track? We don't need the money. Because I think there's still a conversation in the community that we're going to spend $2 million on a track. And I don't think that's accurate. And I think, I think we may spend two to $300,000 on an update in the near future. Or, I mean, we are not going to spend $2 million on a track in the next few years, just given where we're at. And in most, you know, without some change, that money is probably going to go elsewhere. So my feeling is let's have the money be more accurately assigned to kind of where the board is now. I mean, I mean, we could vote the motion down and keep it to the track. It's something that keeps popping up. It, it, and with, I think people justifiably already can one upset about where their taxes are going. There's, you know, and, and two people confused about why I think if we can eliminate a story out there that their taxes are going up because we're hell bent on spending $2 million on a track, regardless, it's, it's easier to tell people that, no, we are not thinking about that money in that light right now, given our tax situation, even though we're still supportive of the track, if we have that money assigned to the track. Yeah. Well, and just to build off of that, Miriam made the point a couple of meetings ago is it's just not it it's not honest. Yeah. If we're not actually thinking we're going to use the money for the track, then it is also in the reverse, putting out a false promise to those who yes. hope we are going to use it that way yeah. if we're not actually intending to. Exactly. It's it's just it's confusing all around. I, and I and I think it would be a more accurate representation if I think where the consensus of the board is. We don't know what we're going to spend that $1.5 million on because we don't know what the next few years brings. We, we realize that we have a great track program. We wanted to, to really build a track that I think that track program deserves. We are not in the position to do that now, but we can certainly do something. And let's, let's set aside some funds to do something to make the track safe, to make it better. Uh, but let's not either give the false impression that we're spending that money is going to be spent on the track regardless of where taxes go. And let's not also give the impression to, you know, the kids that are coming up through the track and, you know, maybe in sixth grade and be like, 
well, I'm going to have a, a great track when I'm in ninth grade, that that's not going to be the case, or it's probably not going to be the case, or at least not the track that, that we originally envisioned building. Uh, Chris and then Jill. And could I also, just want to be cognizant that it's like yeah. 905. Could we also um, signal in our meeting summary and or our minutes that the context of, say, if there is a $400,000 encumbrance to kind of re get the track to a yeah. place of safe standard, um, you know, the board is directing, you know, or advising administration to move ahead with a process to do an assessment, you know, that includes the input of yeah. students and our incredible, incredible, incredible coaches i mean my heart is just overwhelmed by the amount of time and effort and the opportunity that you are creating for our students i just want to deeply thank you um so i just wonder if within our summary and in our minutes we can specifically you know make a a nod to that we are moving ahead with a process um around assessment and to make a more responsible um expenditure on the track conservative yeah what did I say? Conser you said responsible. I'm just editorializing. Conservative investment. Yeah. Sure. More, more conservative. Sure. Yeah. Hey. yeah. Jill. Can I go real quick? I'm really bothered by a clarification. We heard a couple minutes ago that there is no money to do anything to the track in either the athletics or at the buildings and grounds. I think if, if parents were expected to go in and clean up the basketball court for kids to play basketball or the kids were painting the lines, I think there would be complaints. So I don't understand why not only are we not providing a safe track, doesn't sound like we're spending any money. And is I, I remember the days when the city owned our grounds and that was like, and like the rec department or something. So there was always like this tension. And I'm wondering if maybe this is a holdover of that. I'm wondering if the tennis courts have the same lack of upkeep and the same dependence on volunteers. But I just think it's really imbalanced if you look at the number of kids who participate and that there's nothing that parents have to sweep the track off and it's not safe. If, if the basketball court wasn't safe, we wouldn't, that wouldn't be stood for. So I don't understand why the track isn't at least some minimal maintenance or safety as part of our athletics or our buildings budget. And maybe it is, but that's, that's what I'm concerned about now. It well, shouldn't be. You're going to redo it. Yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> okay. We're going to do a brand new one. So. Okay. Um, well, there, that's why there wasn't money for immediate upgrades because we the original plan was that it was as soon as the snow melted, it was going to start. The work was going to start on it. Okay. Like we weren't going to use it this year, this season at all, because it was supposed to get started. Thank you. That makes sense. <laughs> And there may be minimal things. I don't know exactly what how that co-curricular is. It's, I mean, it's obviously the salaries that we pay coaches and all that kind of stuff. And there's always uniforms and all of that piece in there. So, to, so for me to say there's nothing in there for the track is not accurate. I just don't know exactly how much for what cost. Thank you. Okay. So I hear Scott withdrawing his motion. I think I hear pretty clear communication from the board to Andrew and Libby that at some point it doesn't have to be immediate because I know we have things to do with holidays coming up. Uh, some sort of an assessment of what a, a fix would look like that would bring our existing track up to a usable and less embarrassing position. Safe. safe. And safe. Well, to be I'm usable, I'm encompassing safe as part of that. Um, and then I'm hearing that there's a desire for someone, maybe Scott again, to make a motion to to unencumber 1.5 million and leave $400,000 as a set aside for um, future work track. renovations, so, upgrades oh, to, oh. to the track. With the idea that we could move that numbers slightly in either direction. Andrew, you, you're you twitching. This is, you're trying to, that number, it's a big number. But yeah. that's that's a lot. I, I, I can't imagine, given what we're working with, that we could ever spend $400,000. But I think that number is very large. So if there's a mechanism to... Uh, well, we can always bring it down. Yeah, it's, yeah I mean, it's like a but we're not like forcing you to spend that yeah. much money. But, <laughs> but it, it takes yeah, it takes it takes oh, roughly seventy five percent of the the current sure. money, and it puts it into a different category. And I know my math was a perfect, Jake. No, you're correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
and say what it's worth. Yes. Uh, so when we, when we get these estimates, it would be great to have like a little bit of an option table, like safe and usable, it's basic. And then I think Nathan is saying he'd like to have meats there, which is, yeah. seems to me like sort of the pinnacle. So the range would be good to know. We don't have a motion on the table right now. And it's yeah. right tricky. Yeah. 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 I find it a little tricky. Like I don't want to do too many repairs if there's still a hope of replacing the track. Like so there's sort of this balance of like, I don't want to say no within the next five years. We definitely will not. No. But and I don't think we so have to. And and I and at like nine, ten, I I think we're at a good spot where we can have a conversation about this yeah. later. I will do. Do you want to make the motion? I can make the motion. Yes. I move to unencumber one point five million dollars of the track earmark, leaving four hundred thousand dollars for track uh, program and facility improvements. Second. Second. Since so we have a motion, we have to have an opportunity for further discussion. I mean, further discussion. I thought someone did an estimate, but I just want to appreciate the. U32 track team that came out a couple of years ago yeah. kind of blew my mind. The whole U32 track team came and they advocated for their neighbors to have a facility that was close to theirs. And it was just incredibly moving. And, and all the kids that have come out, the little boy that said that there were rocks in their knees, I can never forget that. No, thank you. And, and thank you to everyone who's um, yeah, continued to to advocate for this and and been part of all all of our co-curricular programs uh they're all extremely valuable and i think the passion we see around it reflects that um all those in favor aye. Aye. any opposed um thank you all um motion to adjourn so moved second second all those in favor Bye. Thanks, everyone. This is great work. It's been a tough budget season, and I really appreciate the, the thoughtfulness.